Well, hello there. My name is Kain. I'm a League of Legends coach and content creator, and I'm glad to see that you're interested in my Season 14 Vladimir Guide. I've made tons of Vladimir Guides in the past, so for this guide I had the idea to create my very own Vladimir Bible. A guide that includes all my knowledge. This guide will offer both new content for Season 14 specifically, but also content from my previous Vladimir Guides, because some things haven't changed yet, so it would be a time waste to go over something that hasn't changed at all. So for example, the Ability Overview section in this guide will be the exact same as the Ability Overview from my last guide. This allows me to create the ultimate Vladimir Guide, my very own Vladimir Bible. Now obviously League of Legends has two components, the Knowledge component and the actual Implementation component. That's why this guide will also be split up in two parts. This video serves as the first part, which includes all kinds of information about mindset, champion identity, abilities, summoner spells, items, combos, game plans, common mistakes, tips and tricks, matchups and skins. In the second part of this guide, which is a separate video, I will be commentating on actual in-game Vladimir content to show you how to implement the knowledge from this video in actual solo queue games. Now on top of that, you can also book my personal coaching. So if you're really serious about climbing the ranked ladder and achieving your season 14 ranked goals, you can definitely order my personal coaching. So if you're interested in that, feel free to check out the link in the description down below. All right, let's get started. The first thing you need to understand in order to become a Vladimir main or enhance your Vladimir skills is the specific Vladimir identity and the mindset that comes with that. A champion's identity is basically all the specific things that make your champion stand out from all the other champions, while also understanding the weaknesses and strengths that are a consequence of those champion specific attributes. Now let's take a look at Vladimir's specific champion attributes and afterwards we'll take an in-depth look at each attribute. First of all, Vladimir is one of the strongest scaling champions in League of Legends. Meaning that Vladimir isn't that strong early on, but that's compensated by his ridiculously strong late game. Secondly, Vladimir is all about healing and sustain. Vlad can get healing from his Q, W and ult. And last but not least, Vladimir is an AoE champion, meaning that Vladimir excels at dealing damage to multiple people at the same time as opposed to picking off people in the 1v1. Now that we know what the Vladimir specific attributes are, let's take a closer look at them. So first of all we said that Vladimir is a scaling champion. Now lots of people know that Vladimir is an amazing scaling champion, however, not a lot of people fully understand what scaling means. Scaling doesn't mean that it's okay to give up all prio and all objectives until you're strong. If you play like that, you will find yourself reaching your peak strength at the same time when the enemies have already reached your nexus. Scaling actually means that whenever the enemy team captures an objective or makes a play somewhere on the map, we're going to be making a trade as well, somewhere else on the map. This is called objective trading. For example, whenever the enemy team takes a dragon, maybe see if you can dive the enemy top laner, or at the very least, push your lane and look to take turret plates. Yes, taking plates might be less value compared to taking a dragon, but that's the meaning of scaling. Scaling means that we're still going to do objective trading, but we're okay with trading something back of lesser value because we're not as strong as the enemy team in the early stages of the game. It's just crucial that we always trade something back, Otherwise, the gold cap will be so big that the enemy team will finish the game before you've become strong enough to carry the game yourself. So please, whenever the enemy team has prio and starts a dragon and there's nothing you can do about it, don't just recall and do nothing, but try to take as many minion waves, turret plates, enemy jungle camps as possible, or even look to kill the enemies on the other side of the map. Okay, now that we understand what scaling means, how do we actually scale? The main thing, the very fundamental idea of Vladimir, is that you scale most consistently by constantly farming throughout the game. It's impossible to know before a game how many kills or objectives you'll be able to secure, but it's definitely possible to control how much you farm in a game, which makes farming a very consistent way to obtain gold and XP. My personal rule of thumb is that you should never have less than 8 CS per minute on average, no matter what rank you play in. And keep in mind that 8 CS per minute isn't even that good. Also keep in mind that I'm not just talking about having 8 CS per minute during the laning phase, but throughout the entire game. As a Vladimir player, it's crucial that you never stop farming throughout the entire game. It's not as if you farm until you have two items and then you just stop farming because you're strong enough. No, you always need to keep on farming. I can't stress this enough. Practically, this means that once the laning phase is over, you will have to be disciplined and go to the side lanes to consistently soak solo XP and gold. Vladimir's second specific attribute is his built-in sustain. A lot of people do not actively play around Vladimir's sustain. 
understanding the role of your sustain is necessary to consistently win lanes. In the late game, Vladimir one-shots entire teams, so playing around sustain isn't that important in the late game. However, playing around your sustain is crucial during the laning phase, because in the early stages of the lane phase, Vladimir has some significant weaknesses, such as high cooldowns and low mobility. So if you want to consistently get high CS numbers or even win your lanes, you will have to be creative and outplay your opponents. Sustain is one of the main tools that allows you to do that. You need to understand that even if you're playing versus lane bullies such as Victor, you can still outplay them by draining their mana pool with your sustain. All you have to do is take trades with the Victor, even if the trade seems bad at first, because you can heal up after and Victor can't. So you will still win the trade, and if you repeat this process, slowly but surely, you will drain his mana pool and you will have a free lane. And last but not least, Vladimir's third specific attribute is his AoE damage. You need to understand that Vladimir has an ult EW combo that can one shot an entire team with just that one combo. So it doesn't make sense that you would focus on killing people in the 1v1 if you can force a 5 vs 5 fight around an objective like a Baron and then you just get a Penta. So your role as Vladimir is to scale as quickly as possible, to become as strong as possible, to dominate team fights. If you have 3 items, including a Rabadon's death cap, and you have everything at your disposal, like your ultimate and summoner spells, you need to force a big fight to kill the enemy team instead of using all your resources like summoner spells and ult to pick off the enemy ADC before the dragon fight. Now that we understand Vladimir's champion identity, and we already know some very important practical implications that come with that specific champion identity, we're ready to take a look at the mindset you need to adopt to successfully climb the ranked ladder with Vladimir. First of all, being patient and having discipline is crucial. You need to understand that whenever you're playing Vladimir, it's more important to not fall behind than to get ahead. I'll give you a clear example to explain this concept. If you're playing an easy matchup, for example Vladimir versus Ari, you will have a lot of kill pressure. But let's say the enemy team has a Shaco, so a jungler who likes to gank early and on repeat. Even though you theoretically have kill pressure on Ari, it could be very dangerous to try and kill Ari because of the enemy Shaco who's probably going to gank you on repeat if you give him the opportunity. So here it's very easy to say if you're playing Vlad, I'm going to chill and scale instead of perma fighting Ari because I'm a scaling champion and fighting early against Shaco Ari might be dangerous. This is a luxury that we have as Vladimir players, because imagine that you play something like LeBlanc and you're not able to snowball early, your game might actually be over. Now something else that's very important when it comes to discipline is that you always have to keep on farming throughout the game no matter what your team says. If you have a huge wave under your turret but your jungler is asking you to come to scuttle, do not give in and keep on farming the minions and ignore your jungler. Especially if you're not used to this type of playstyle, you might be very tempted to help your teammates and give up too much farm while doing so. So a great tip is to mute everyone in your game and have discipline and keep on farming no matter what. It's better that you overdo the farming and that you're not as impactful in the mid game or something than that you're always roaming and that you're underdoing the farming. Now in order to make you understand how gold reliant Vladimir is, let us compare Vladimir to other scaling champions like Kassadin and Kale for example. Both Kassadin and Kale could hard carry games the second they hit level 16, even if their farm is not that good. As opposed to Kale and Kassadin, Vladimir does not become extremely strong at level 16. In fact, Vladimir's ultimate damage at level 16, compared to level 15 when you had only 2 points in R, is quite underwhelming. So yes, Vladimir does outscale a Kassadin and even a Kale, but not because you have a stronger power spike at level 16, but because your champion is very farm oriented. If you don't have good CS, you will be outscaled by level 16 Kassadin and the Kale. Now another misconception that's ingrained in the mindset of most Vladimir players is that Vladimir is weak early on. And as a result, they play way too passively and avoid all early fighting. Vladimir is not as weak early on as everybody thinks. He just has some weaknesses that in some matchups might make it hard for you to get something done early on. So most of the time you should be able to farm almost perfectly while also being able to trade with your lane opponent and look for early opportunities, even roam opportunities. Yes we're playing the scaling champion, but we are far from weak early on and we should always look to get something done. And that's where limit testing comes in. Limit testing is the most important part of playing Vladimir. Vladimir is this ultra scaling selfish champion. This champion shouldn't even be viable in solo queue because solo queue is extremely chaotic and often solo queue games do not allow you to get to the late game stages of the game. So Vladimir is far from a broken champion unless you can find a way to become this ultra strong raid boss in the mid game instead of in the late game. You can only become ultra strong in the mid game if you know your limits 
perfectly. Imagine a Vladimir player with zero kills, zero deaths and zero assists with 160 CS at 20 minutes into the game, so 8 CS per minute. This Vladimir will be pretty strong, but far from broken. But imagine the same Vladimir, but now with 200 farm at 20 minutes, so 10 CS per minute, and 3 kills instead of 0. Now this Vladimir is absolutely broken. And you can consistently be broken in the majority of your games if you know your limits. Because knowing your limits is the difference between killing your lane opponent or getting killed, and the outcome of that can snowball and completely decide your game. Now something else that should be ingrained in your mindset is understanding your role as a Vladimir. Vladimir's role is to dominate team fights with his AoE abilities like his ultimate. How do you dominate team fights? By one-shotting the enemy high-value backline targets such as the enemy ADC and mid laner. You should almost never do anything else than this. Dominating team fights and going for the enemy backline is your role, and you do not want to start compensating your role to help your teammates fulfill their role. You do not carry games by helping your teammates achieving what they need to do, because that doesn't give you time to do what you have to do. And if you are extremely good at what you need to do, fulfilling your role, you will hard carry games anyway, even though your teammates might be struggling. Now something else that's extremely important to become a great Vladimir player is understanding how people can counter Vladimir. Because if you understand how people can counter you, you can come up with a way to prevent them from countering you. Now Vladimir can be countered in two main ways. First of all, people can bully you in lane and make your life miserable. Champions that fit into this category are champions with consistent pokes such as control mages, like Victor and Oriana, or champions that are really good at running you down, like champions such as Irelia for example. Vladimir also gets countered by champions who are really good at roaming, so champions like Twisted Fate for example aren't that strong into the Vladimir if you look at the 1v1, Vladimir can even dodge Twisted Fate's gold card with pool, but starting from level 6, Twisted Fate can choose to perma shift the wave and out roam you. The goal of the Twisted Fate in this scenario is not to kill you in the 1v1, but to help out his team to the point that his team will end the game before you've become strong. Now that we understand how Vladimir gets countered, we can create playstyles to prevent us from being countered in these situations. There's two ways to counter us, and that leads to two fundamentals that we always have to think about. Fundamental number one, make sure that you don't die in lane. Now this is obviously easier said than done, but we can do this by focusing on wave mechanics, selecting the right setup such as runes, summoner spells and builds, and also warding properly. Fundamental number two is make sure your opponent can't outroam you. You can do this by focusing on wave mechanics and fighting your lane opponent whenever they want to roam to keep them in lane and focusing on your tempo recalls is also a great method to make sure your lane opponent doesn't outroam you. And last but not least, there's something you really need to understand in order to play Vladimir at the highest level. You could argue if this belongs in the mindset section, but I deem it so important that I feel like it's become part of the Vladimir mindset. I'm talking about understanding Vladimir's main weakness, mobility. Even if you find yourself in late game and you're turbo strong, all it takes is one stun or maybe even a slow or an exhaust to completely make you useless. So when you're playing Vladimir, you should look for tools that enhance your mobility. For example, Face Rush and Nimbus Cloak and Runes, or Ghost and Flash and Summoner spells, etc. Okay, now that we finally and fully understand both Vladimir's champion identity and the mindset that comes with that, we're ready to take a look at Vladimir's abilities. First of all, we have Vladimir's passive Crimson Pact. Vladimir gains one ability power for every 30 bonus health. He also gains 1.6 max health per one ability power. So basically, the more AP you have, the more health you get, and the more bonus health you have, the more AP you get. Bonus health is basically any health you gain except for health from levels. Then we have Vlad's Q, Transfusion. Vladimir drains his target's life force, dealing magic damage and restoring health. After using this ability twice, Vladimir gains move speed for 0.5 seconds and empowers the next use of his ability for 2.5 seconds. The empowered version of this ability deals more magic damage and restores health plus missing health. It's extremely important to know that empowered healing is reduced to 30% against minions. 
A lot of people think that both Vlad's normal Qs and empowered Qs have less healing on minions, but this is only the case for Vlad's empowered Qs. So this is how Vlad's Q works. Vlad's normal Q heals you the same amount, whether it's from minions, from champions or from jungle camps. Vlad's empowered Q heals the same amount from champions as from jungle camps, but from minions you get less healing. Then we have Vlad's W, his pool. Vladimir sinks into a pool of blood for 2 seconds, gaining decaying move speed for 1 second and becoming untargetable and ghosted while slowing enemies in the pool by 40%. Vladimir deals magic damage over the duration and restores health equal to 15% of the damage dealt. So Vlad's pool slows enemies, it gives himself decaying move speed, deals damage to enemies and restores health based on the damage dealt. So whenever you're fighting with somebody and you're planning on pulling underneath him, try to simultaneously pull underneath as many minions as possible as this will increase your healing. Or if you're fighting against multiple enemies, try to pull underneath all of them to heal as much as possible. Another great tip with this could be that if you're fighting around jungle camps, try to pull underneath the jungle camp and the enemy simultaneously to maximize your healing. However, keep in mind that activating your W costs a lot of health as well, so it's important to restore as much health as possible. And last but not least, you can cancel Vlad's Q animation with your pool. <laughs> Vladimir's E is called Tides of Blood and does the following. Begin charging, Vladimir charges up a reservoir of blood, spending health. While at full charge, Vladimir is slowed by 20%. Release, Vladimir unleashes a torrent of blood missiles at surrounding enemies, dealing more damage based on charge time. If this ability was charged for at least 1 second, it also slows targets by 40% for 0.5 seconds. So here it's important to know that your E can slow enemies and that you can combine E with W. So you press E first, then you press W, and then you can charge your E while in W so that you can hit more people and the enemies can't interrupt your E charging. Another important thing you should know about Vlad's E is that if your E gets cancelled while you're charging it, the damage from the already stored blood won't go off. So you'll lose the HP, but the damage won't go off, which can be very frustrating. When your E is fully charged, it will automatically release after a while and you can also release your E by using Q. So if you're charging your E and while charging you use Q, then your E will release. However, in theory this is a nice mechanic because the E into Q combo is a very useful combo but it feels extremely clunky. So instead of releasing E with Q, you should release E manually by lifting your finger off your E button and then just quickly pressing your Q after. And last but not least you can activate Ghost while in E to get in range of enemies and this mechanic is especially good with Nimbus Cloak. Now let's take a look at Vladimir's ultimate, Hemo Plague. Vladimir creates a plague causing its victims to take 10% increased damage from all sources for 4 seconds. After it expires, Vladimir deals magic damage to all infected targets. Vladimir restores health if he hits a champion and restores additional health for each champion beyond the first. Here it's extremely important to know that when you hit your ultimate onto enemies, they will take 10% extra damage from all sources afterwards. So if you want to maximize your damage, your combo should start with your ultimate so that your other abilities can do 10% increased damage. Another useful tip could be that you can actually proc face rush with the first part of your ultimate. The first part of your ultimate doesn't do damage and I think that's why people don't know about this. 
but you can in fact proc face rush with the first part of your ultimate. When it comes to summoner spells for Vladimir, especially in season 14, Ghost Flash is almost always the best setup you could go. Ghost is just so versatile. You could use Ghost during the early lane phase to take an amazing trade with your lane opponent that you would not have been able to take without the extra movement speed of Ghost. This can either help you to fix a bad lane state or to even start to win your lane. So Ghost partially replaces Teleport because if you're creative with your Ghost usage, you can go even or even win difficult matchups without having to go Teleport. Ghost Flash is also amazing for side laning. Whenever you're in a side lane like bot or top, you really need extra tools for mobility to run down your opponents in these long lanes or to escape from enemies trying to run you down in these long lanes. And obviously Ghost Flash is the best setup you can go for team fights, because Vladimir's biggest weakness is mobility, but Ghost Flash makes you a very mobile champion, which allows you to hard carry team fights. Now theoretically you could go teleport flash in very hard lanes like Anivia or Orianna for example. But like I said, if you're creative with your ghost usage, you don't need teleport at all. You could also go ignite flash or ignite ghost, but personally I feel like ghost flash almost always outperforms these setups. Unless you're playing Vladimir top. If you play Vladimir top, going ghost ignite is a very good option because in top lane you will be forced to fist fight your opponent a lot more compared to mid. So having ignite and ghost to match very aggressive champs is crucial in the top lane because if you die once in top, your game might be over due to how snowbally the top lane is. But obviously going Ghost Flash in top lane is also really good. I just prefer Ghost Ignite in matchups where I can't avoid fighting my lane opponent, like a Riven or Fiora for example. But you could also go Ghost Ignite in mid lane for example. Lately I've been really enjoying going Ghost Ignite with Conqueror and fistfight matchups like Silas. Ultimately all of this is personal preference, but Ghost Flash is objectively the most versatile setup and the best for late game scaling. So if you're able to be creative with it, you can also make it work in the early game and that's why it has the most potential, specifically as well for season 14. That's it for the summoner spells overview, now let's take a look at the runes. Alright, when we talk about rune pages for Vladimir, there are an insane amount of options available. We could theoretically think of things like Conqueror, Electrocute, Predator, potentially even Dark Harvest, Airy obviously, Face Rush, you could even go Grasp in certain matchups, or First Strike and Unsealed Spellbook. Now all of these setups are viable in some kind of way, does that mean they're always optimal? No. I'm not going to talk about all of these setups, because in my opinion there are three setups that are currently specifically in Season 14 dominating all of the other setups and thus outperforming all of the other setups in the majority of your games. Those three setups, the setups that I'm going to be talking about today, are Conqueror, Airy, and Face Rush. Does that mean that, for example, if you want to go Predator, you can't? Because I said it's not optimal. No, you can still go Predator. I just believe that in most of your games, you're going to be outperforming Predator if you go either Conqueror, Airy, or Face Rush. And this counts for all the potential rune setups. Let's start with Conqueror. This is one of the three setups that I really want to talk about. Now before we make the rune page and we talk about adaptations of the rune page, why would we ever go Conqueror? I would go Conqueror in two situations. In, like in two conditions. Both conditions need to be met for me to go Conqueror. The first condition would be when I'm playing versus champion that it's almost going to be impossible to avoid fighting them. For example when you fight versus a Yasuo or a Yon or a Silas. These are matchups that whether you like it or not, you're almost always going to have to fight them level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You won't be able to avoid fighting them at all. So then having that extra fist fighting power of Conqueror is going to help you a lot. Also, Conqueror will be able to, like you will be able to stack it quite efficiently because you're playing versus melee champions like a Yasuo, like a Yon, like a Silas, right? You can get in a lot of attacks because they're melee. So you can basically stack your Conqueror quite well. Now, obviously I wouldn't go Conqueror, even though I have a good mid lane matchup to use it if the enemy team exists out of a lot of ranged squishy champions. Because against ranged squishy champions, I will not be able to stack my Conqueror because they will be one-shottable. So I will just kill them immediately and then having more bursts like, I don't know, Airy Scorch or Electrocute would be better. So the second condition to be met when you go Conqueror is when the enemy team have multiple melee or tank bruiser type of champions. For example, situation where Conqueror would be great is if the enemy team has something like a Cyan top lane with an Amumu jungle and a Silas mid lane. They have three beefy bruiser or even tank champions that allows you to stack your Conqueror quite efficiently and having a Silas in the mid game matchup, in the mid lane matchup, will also help you like 
Conqueror would also be very efficient in that matchup. Now that we know what conditions need to be met to go Conqueror, let's make the standard Conqueror rune page. So the standard Conqueror rune page is going to look something like this. So obviously we select Conqueror, Triumph, Legend, Tenacity here, Last Stand, Nimbus Cloak, Transcendence. This is going to be the standard Conqueror setup. Obviously they also change like what I like to call the mini runes here. So nowadays I like to go this for scaling, this to compensate with some damage, and then obviously go health scaling. If the enemy team has a lot of CC, you could go with 10% extra tenacity and slow resist. This is obviously extremely good on Vladimir. Obviously if they don't have that much CC, you just go with health scaling, because that's also very good on Vladimir. Now this is the main setup. Could you adjust something to this main setup and why would you do it? Now I would say yes, you can make some adjustment to this, just not that much. I would change anything of the primary uh, rune page here. But the second rune tree here, the sorcery rune tree, we can make some adjustments. If you want to focus more on roaming, you could go, for example, celerity and water walking. Or you could, instead of going transcendence, you could go with, or like instead of Nimbus Cloak, you could go with um, Gathering Storm and Transcendence. What's the difference here? This will help you more with scaling. If you go with Gathering Storm instead of Nimbus Cloak, you're going to be missing out on some movement speed. Now, if you have Ghost Flash, Nimbus Cloak isn't uh, that important. It's always useful, but it's not crucial if you have Ghost flash as a summoner spell setup. Now, if you go something like Ghost Ignite, then it might be a lot more important to say, I'm not going to go Gathering Storm, but I'm going to go Nimbus Cloak and Transcendence. Personally, I wouldn't really change Transcendence here. You could change it to this for more roaming, but honestly, I feel like Transcendence is extremely crucial on Vladimir, and you should almost never change it. So then the only two adaptations that I would make is either go for Scorch here for even more fistfight power, go for Nimbus Cloak, especially if you have Ignite, and you could go Gathering Storm if you're playing for more scaling. But Gathering Storm, it doesn't make that much sense in my opinion because we're going with Conqueror because we're in a very fistfight heavy matchup. So then we're not thinking too much about scaling anyway. We should be thinking more about going Scorch or Nimbus Cloak then for the extra uh, mobility to win the lane or for the extra damage to win the lane. Now, theoretically, you could also go into the Resolve Tree. If you're playing versus something like Poke or Burst, you could go uh, Bone Plating into Burst, Second Twint against Poke. And you could go something like this, very lane oriented. Now, personally, I'm not a big fan of mixing Resolve Tree with the Precision Tree. I feel like if you go Conqueror, you're kind of forced to go Transcendence here, to go the Sorcery page just for the Transcendence. And then you can either select Nimbus Cloak or Scorch with Transcendence, right? But I would always go Transcendence. That's why I don't like to go for, uh, into the Resolve Tree. Because if you go Resolve, yes, you might have some more Sustain, but you're giving up the Transcendence, which is extremely valuable in my opinion. All right, now that we know what the Conqueror page looks up, uh, looks like and what the adaptations are, let's start a new rune page. And now we're going to be looking at Airy. Now, why would you ever go Airy? So before we're going to make the rune page and we're going to look at the adaptations, why would we want to go Airy? Airy gives you even more fistfight power and lane domination than Conqueror will ever give you. Airy Scorch is basically... The easiest way to get some extra damage, you don't have to do a lot for it, just auto attack or uh, use an ability. And it does quite an insane amount of damage, especially when combined with Scorch. In very free lanes, I like to go Airy Scorch. In lanes where I can consistently damage my opponent, in lanes where I know I have a kill pressure onto them. In those lanes, I like to go Airy Scorch. Conqueror it could be both good in lane and in the mid game. Every Scorch obviously doesn't scale that good towards the mid game stages or the late game stages of the game, but you do get more fistfight power in the early lane. So I like to go every Scorch in very free matchups or in matchups where I just need the extra fistfight power. For example, again, against the Fizz or Rakiana, for example, in those matchups, it could be really nice to have every Scorch because they're melee, they're extremely short range, and you can definitely constantly poke them with Airy and Scorch, for example, here. Now, I especially like to go Airy with Scorch, for example, very lane oriented when i have a jungler and a support perhaps who allows me to play aggressively for example even if i'm playing versus a kiana but the enemy team have a shaco jungle and i have a cartus jungle so the enemy team has a very ganking type of jungler and i have a scaling type of jungler going airy scores and perma fist fighting my lane opponent might not be the smartest thing to do because that means that i might be pushing towards my lane opponent and now i get ganked by a shaco and my cartus who's farming and scaling obviously can't back me up so now there's not much point of going every scorch and playing for lane if you have a scaling type of jungler and the enemy team has an aggressive type of jungler. However, when I have something like a Nidalee or a Lee Sin or a Jarvan or an Elise or a Shaco, you name it, anything that's somewhat aggressive and I'm playing versus a Kiana, I will go every scorch. Because not only can I bully and destroy my lane opponents, but I also have a jungler and perhaps even a support that likes to roam like a Pyke or a Rakan 
who can help me like when I'm pushing in the opponent, they can help me with even securing the kill and turret diving and stuff like that. So Ares Scorch is very aggressive and personally, I'm the type of Vladimir who likes to go aggressive. I'm the type of Vladimir who likes to get more out of lane than just scaling, sitting back and relaxing. Because if you have a 5-0 Draven and the enemy team, it's all fun and games if you have like 10 CS per minute. But if you don't have any kills, it's still going to be hard to shut down that Draven. So in those situations, it might be better to go like airy scorch so that you can like kill your lane opponent, get have an easier time creating that initial lead, and now you might actually be able to deal with the Draven. So I also like to go airy scorch when I see that the enemy team has a lot of snowball heavy champions, something like a very aggressive type of champion that's very good at once they get a kill, they snowball. Like a Katarina or a Draven, those type of champions, right? Or even a Kiana or a Fizz. Now, what does the Airy Scorch or the Airy, I like to call it Airy Scorch because I always go Scorch with Airy. So that's why I call it Airy Scorch. How does this setup, like what does this setup look like? Well, it looks like this. You go Nimbus Cloak. I'm just going to show you the standard rune page, right? And then we go this. Well, actually this. But this is going to be the standard Airy Scorch rune page. Now, could you make some adaptations? Yes, you could make some adaptations. Against certain matchups, especially if you go Ghost Flash, you could again give up Nimbus Cloak and go for Nullifying Orb, for example, if you really wish to. For those of you who don't know, Nullifying Orb is basically a Hex Shrinker passive. So if you play versus an AP champion, who you like to fist fight a lot and you think you can fist fight them and you have kill pressure, like a fist, for example, but the fist might also have kill pressure onto you because they like to go Ignite then Nullifying Orb is a great option if you don't want to go Nimbus Cloak. So here you either go Nimbus Cloak or Nullifying Orb. So I'm just going to put it on Nimbus Cloak because this is like the most standard setup. And then here you could go Absolute Focus for even more damage. But like I said, I will never change Transcendence. I think it's absolutely ridiculous how significant this rune is for Vladimir. So I will never change it. I will always go transcendent, Transcendence out of these three when I'm playing Vladimir. And then here, I don't really see this as an option. It could be if you want to roam, but I don't really see it as an option. Um, you could go with Scorch or Gathering Storm. I don't see Gathering Storm as an option either, because I feel like the whole point of me picking Aerie is to have more like aggressive potential in lane. I have more kill pressure in lane. Then why would I choose here for scaling? If I want to go Gathering Storm with scaling, I could go a more scaling rune setup like Face Rush. And that's something we're going to talk about in just a bit. So here, since I go Airy, I like to go Scorch. I also believe that Airy is like only viable if you combine it with Scorch. I don't see it being viable without Scorch because it's a combination that's so deadly. Now, in the second rune tree, we can make some more adaptations. You can see here that the standard setup here is Magical Footwear and Cosmic Insight. Now, Magical Footwear and Cosmic Insight is scaling. This basically says we have some kind of scaling in our setup. In some matchups, however, you do not want to go magical footwear. In some matchups, you might need an early boots. For example, in matchups where you have to dodge skill shots, like a Cassiopeia Q. If you get hit by a Cassiopeia Q, you need to dodge it. Otherwise, you get hit and you lose your entire HP bar because you got hit once by an ability. So in some matchups, it's very important. It's crucial to dodge skill shots and then you want to buy your boots early on. Magical footwear doesn't allow you to do that. So if you're, if you're in a game and for some reason... You need to buy boots early on. Don't go Magical Footwear. Instead, you could go with Futures Market and Cosmic Insight. Now, Cosmic Insight here is extremely valuable because we said that Vladimir's main weakness is mobility. Now, the strongest thing about Cosmic Insight is that it gives you Summoner Spell Haste. So you will literally have your Ghost and Flash more available, which is obviously amazing because now that means that you have more mobility and that you're less immobile. However, sometimes... We can't go Cosmic Insight, even though how amazing it is. Sometimes you play against something like a Fizz or a Kiana and you notice, hey, and this is personal, right? Some people struggle more in matchups than other people. But if you find yourself struggling in a certain matchup, even though you go Airy Scorch, you might want to go into the Resolve Tree and pick up some more resistances. If you play versus Burst, you could so go something like Bone Plating against the Burst and then scaling resistances with Overgrowth. Or you could go Revitalize or even more healing in the lane and sustain. Or you could even go in flinching. Personally, I don't like to go in flinching. And um, this is more when the enemy teams have like a lot of CC. Then you could go this, but then I'm going to go with the precision tree anyway. So I don't like to go this. I never go this. So I either go bone plating with revitalize or bone plating with overgrowth against burst. And against poke, I go second wind with revitalize or second wind with overgrowth. When do I decide between revitalize and overgrowth? Well, it basically means can I win my lane with second wind or do I need the extra healing power from revitalize? If I notice that I need the extra healing power from revitalize, I go this, otherwise I'm gonna cheese my way into overgrowth and get some scaling resistances. You could theoretically also go conditioning here, but conditioning only gives you resistances after 20 minutes basically. 
and that might be too late. So if you're really playing for the early laning phase, you might need some bone plating or second wind in the early game. And then you can choose between Overgrowth and Revitalize. Now, I also told you that when the enemy team have a lot of CC, especially like in lane itself, for example, you could go with something like Triumph here and then Legend Tenacity. This will give you more uh, tenacity, so you're less, uh, you're more immune to crowd control, which could be very useful. Now, if I don't need the tenacity, if I don't need the extra sustain versus the crowd control, I'm going to go with Last Stand. Again, for the extra damage, the lower we get, the more damage we do. And it's very likely that we're going to get somewhat low because we go every Scorch, so we're prepared to fist fight our lane opponent. And if you're prepared to fist fight your lane opponent, you're probably going to get low at some point, and then Last Hand will, Last Stand will help you with damage the lower you get so it's amazing so here typically i like to go last stand and uh, triumph actually i think i showed it like this triumph and magic nasty but i like to go triumph and last stand right and if i need more tenacity resist if the enemy team has a lot of uh, crowd control i like to go last stand and then go tenacity so this combination or this combination here but always go last stand that's basically it for this setup here in the mini runes obviously you could go this a little bit more scaling and even tenacity but since I play for lane and early game damage, I like to go with two adaptive forces here, then some scaling health or tenacity, depending on the game. Now that's it for the Ares Scorch setup. Now let's take a look at the last setup or like the last most optimal setup, in my opinion. Like out of all the setups, I think Faceverse is the best scaling one. Doesn't mean it's the most optimal setup in the entire game for Vladimir, but it's one of those three most optimal setups. So Faceverse, for example, when would you ever want to go Faceverse? Well, basically, when you're really focused on scaling. If you go face rush, as opposed to going something like Airy Scorch or Conqueror, you will have a lot less fist fighting power in lane. That's just what it is. But you will have more scaling. Face rush helps you with more mobility, so it's amazing for those late game team fights. And also in lane, if you play versus something like a Cassiopeia or an Orianna or any hard matchup, really, you can go face rush because it helps you escape and avoid taking an insane amount of damage. And it helps you as well about like it avoids you being run down even if you play versus something like a Trindamir in the top lane or a rumble or an irelia you could instead of going conquer or something very fist fight heavy you could go face rush and use that slow resist and actual uh, movement speed burst to escape their rundown potential that also means that face rush is really great for side laning as well because in the side laning a lot of times mobility is a problem you'll either get run down in the long lane or you will be able to run down your opponent and face rush helps you with both of those things. So face rush is again very versatile. It's just about can we get away with using face rush in the early game? Or do we need some more fist fight power to get some kills? For example, if I'm playing versus and Shaco in the enemy jungle, and then I'm typically not really prone to fist fight my opponent because I know if I fist fight my opponent, I can easily get ganked by Shaco. So in this matchup, I want to scale and then I'm going to go face rush. But let's say I have like a needly jungle and I'm playing versus a Kiana and the enemy team have a Draven as well. They have a very snowbally team and I have a good jungler who can back me up when I want to play aggressive. Then I wouldn't go with face rush because I might need Airy Scorch to secure some kills early on to be able to deal with that Draven in case he gets fed. But face rush is really for scaling and most of the time you go face rush into very hard matchups like a, an Anivia or an Orianna matchup in those ma or like a Nico matchup in those matchups. Um, where enemies poke you a lot, you can't really fist fight them and then you might have to go the scaling route and then face rush is obviously your best option now face rush the setup for it looks something like this so this is going to be the standard face rush setup actually this is already it and then here we're going to change this so this is the standard face rush setup um, in terms of adaptations what we could do again if you play versus something like an anivia you might want to go nullifying orb it just gives you that extra bit of sustain that the hex drinker passive basically which might be the difference between you dying and not dying or between you dying and the anivia escaping with 2 hp or you killing the anivia so nullifying orb might be a great option especially if you go ghost flash which you typically do when you go uh, face rush because if you go face rush you're planning on scaling and then ghost flash is obviously the best scaling setup so if you go ghost flash you're it's not crucial that you go nimbus cloak it's still useful but it's not necessary it's not crucial so you could swap this out for nullifying orb for some extra resistances then here i would never change anything i think transcendence once more i think it's amazing on vladimir so i would never change it and then here again you could go for more roaming um which does make sense because if you're looking to scale you're trying to avoid 
playing in your lane and you might look for other moments, other situations or opportunities onto the map to move towards. But then again, you also like to take face rush and hard matchups because why would you not take fist fight setup early on if you think that you can't, if you think that you have no kill pressure on your lane opponent. Typically, those are matchups where you don't have kill pressure on your lane opponent, but they might have kill pressure onto you. And then it might be hard to roam if they constantly like push you under your turret so then i typically like to go gathering storm just full scaling or some people like to go scorch to have that extra bit of fist fight power personally i think it's viable i think you could go it it's just personal preference but most of the time i like to go gathering storm and then nimbus cloak here full scaling if you want to contest your lane opponent a little bit more you could go with nullifying orb scorch with this setup with face rush you're still gonna scale amazingly and you will have some more pressure in lane as well against like those ap champions like a victor and a nivia and oriana stuff like that for now i'll just leave it on the standard setup so that's going to be this then this is basically the standard setup again full scaling with magical footwear and cosmic insight but once again we typically take face rush and very hard matchups and then this might be too greedy so we might have to swap this out for resolve to get some extra resistances again spoke which is obvious like and a lot of hard matchups, those are matchups that can poke you. Like those control mages like a Victor. Now, if they can poke you, you typically want to go with second wind. And then you could either go with scaling resistances, or you could say, this is personal preference, depending on how you experience the matchup. No, this matchup is too hard. I need revitalize for the early game. I can't get away with scaling resistances of the overgrowth. Or if you play against burst, you could go with bone plating revitalize or bone plating overgrowth if you can get away with it. Now, a little bit later in this guide, we're going to be talking about some different builds and stuff like that. And at some point, I'm going to mention the Elite 500 build in which he likes to go partially tank. And he likes to go conditioning and overgrowth with that. Because if you go tank, those items are very cheap. You become relatively strong. You get them around minute 15. Conditioning overgrowth skills also. So at that point, you will also have some more armor magic resist and some more HP. So combined with that tanky build, this is a very nice setup to go. Typically, I don't oftentimes go conditioning with overgrowth because in a lot of those matchups where I like to go face rush, it's matchups where I'm struggling. And then I like to go this for optimal and maximum survivability. There are some matchups in which I like overgrowth and um, conditioning here. And that could be against, for example, something like an Akali. An Akali isn't that big of a threat to you early on, but once she hits those level 6, level 7, level 8 levels, she might become a big threat. At that point, having some more HP due to overgrowth and having the resistances of conditioning can actually prevent her from just one-tapping you from 100 to 0 percent and that might be amazing so in certain matchups where like especially assassin matchups that are not really a big threat to me early on but they might be once they get like level 7 8 9 10 11 then conditioning overgrowth could be great as well but there aren't too many matchups i basically only go this into a kali matchup and you also could go grasp in that matchup you could also go airy scourge conquer there's a lot of setups ultimately it all becomes personal preference now another change you could do here is you could go to the precision tree and you could go for example something like Last stand again with, if you play versus a lot of CC, Legend Tenacity, or um, Triumph here with Last Stand. Now, typically, if you go this, you basically say, well, I'm going to go a little bit more into the aggressive with Last Stand. And then you probably want to swap out Gathering Storm for Scorch here. And this is also a pretty fine setup that allows you to have a little bit more kill pressure or like a little bit more fist fight power to match your lane opponent and not go full scaling here um, this depends on personal preference now those are basically all the setups that i want to talk about those are the three main setups does that mean that predator is not viable for example like if you want to go predator does it mean that you can't because in this guide it's not included no go ahead limit test you could go dark harvest for all i care try it out limit test try to find new things and it's not because i haven't mentioned it in this guide that it, therefore it's not viable i just believe that most of the time in most of your games is going to get outperformed by either conqueror face rush or airy scorch but that depends on your personal preference if you have a very specific niche playstyle, then predator might even be the most optimal setup for you so it all depends on personal preference it all depends on your playstyle. but for my playstyle and for the majority of the vladimirs out there for their playstyle, going either conqueror face rush or airy scorch is going to be the best setup in the majority of their games all right now let's talk about the items that we can go on vladimir personally i believe season 14 is amazing for items on vladimir there are multiple builds there's more than just one build that's amazing there are multiple setups that i'm currently enjoying and i would love to share them with you guys now let's not get too hyped and let's get started with the beginning let's take a look at the starting items 
Not much has changed here. You could go either Dark Seal, D-Ring, or a D-Shield, depending on the situation. Now, personally, when I'm in a difficult matchup, a matchup where I can get poked a lot, for example, something like an Anivia, or a Victor, or an Orianna, I'm inclined to go D-Shield, because this will give you the most sustain versus people who can constantly poke you and it's hard for you to trade back onto them. So a lot of those artillery mages or long range control mages who can just constantly poke you and you can't really get onto them, D-Shield is gonna help you with sustaining a lot in those matchups. Now, we also have the other spectrum where you have these champions where it's almost unavoidable to fist fight them. You can easily get onto them, but they can also get easily onto you. I'm talking about matchups like a Silas or a Yon or a Yasuo. In those matchups, it's a lot more beneficial to go Doran's Ring because this is going to give you the damage that you need, but also even more sustain than this shield, even though you're fighting those uh, people due to how the Doran's Ring works. The Doran's Ring is the best setup when you play against champions who like to fuss fight you early on, like level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then Dark Seal is basically saying, hey, I'm going to be as gold efficient as possible, as scaling as possible, as snowbally as possible, but only if I can get away with it. So in easy matchups, for example, if you play versus something like a Corky, you could easily go Dark Seal and just greed your way through the early game. You have to see it like this. Dark Seal is most of the time the best option if you can go it, but there's not a lot of matchups where you can go it, at least in season 14. I feel like most matchups you want to go D-Ring, and sometimes you want to go D-Shield. Now, obviously, in terms of potions, if you go D-Shield, you can only go one potion. If you go D-Ring, you can go two potions. And if you go Dark Seal, you have multiple options. You could go either Refillable Potion or you could go three Red Pots. Refillable Potion gives you, if I'm not mistaken, around 300 HP. And three Red Pots gives you around 450 HP in terms of healing, if I'm not mistaken. Now, it's very obvious. Obviously, you're going to get more healing from uh, the Red Pots, but it might be, well, it is actually less gold efficient than Refillable Potion. So when do you want to go red, three Red Pots or when do you want to go Refillable Potion? You want to go three Red Pots versus Ignite players. So even though, like, let's say you play versus Yasuo. Sometimes, especially in the lower Elos, you might say, oh, this Yasuo doesn't punish me a lot. Like, typically, Yasuos in these Elos, they don't punish me a lot. It's a chill matchup. So in those matchups, if you know that in your elo you can get away in some matchups with just scaling, you can go Dark Seal. But if they go Ignite, you might want to go three red potions to out-sustain them even more than usual. If they don't have Ignite, if you play versus a Katarina with TP, for example, you could go Dark Seal because it's an easy matchup and refillable potion because you're not going to need to sustain because there's not any danger, there's not any threat of Katarina killing you because she has Ignite or because she has Teleport. But obviously, typically, I like to push my advantages in those lanes like Katarina, where it's an easy matchup, and then I just like to go D-Ring instead of going uh, Dark Seal with three red potions. But that is an option. If you're a fan of the Dark Seal, you could go three red potions against Ignite players and Refillable Potion against Teleport players, for example, or Barrier players, whatever. Now, if we look at the early buys here, basically all over the internet, most people have been going Ionian Boots into Fiendish Codex. You might ask, why have Ionian Boots become this popular? Well, they have become even more gold efficient than last season. There are currently 900 gold for an insane amount of stats. So basically, if you go Ionian Boots, your Q immediately gets onto a very short cooldown. And then if you go build the Fiendish Codex afterwards, you have so much ability haste that at this point you have so much sustain with your Q, you're unkillable. So this is an extremely easy setup to go. It's always good. No matter what game you play, in the early game, this will make you invincible. You just cannot die. So when you're like, and when I would have to recommend the player who just like, he says, oh, I, I'm in ranked and I accidentally picked Vladimir, for example, like I'm playing the champion for the first time, but I don't want to dodge. I would recommend this setup towards him because it's so easy. If you don't have a lot of experience on Vladimir, it's so easy. You're almost unkillable. It's extremely easy to play this. However, that doesn't mean that this is always the optimal build. I'm not saying that it isn't optimal. I'm just saying it's not always optimal. Sometimes you have better setups that not a lot of people like to go nowadays, I've seen. But personally, my favorite is not the easiest setup, but it's the most potential setup in certain team comps, and that's the pen boots into Hextech Alternator. This combination, even though it's more, like, it, it's more expensive than this setup, but it gives you an insane amount of burst for still a small amount of gold only. Now, obviously, I wouldn't go this when the enemy teams have like three tanks and like a beefy champion in the mid lane like a Silas. Then I would obviously go Ionians with Fiendish and this, I would build my Fiendish into a Riftmaker. We're going to talk about that in just a bit. But if I'm in a lane where I have a lot of kill pressure and I know that their entire team comp and the enemies is like very squishy like they have something like a look support instead of a leona and they have something like a kindred jungle 
or like um, an Elise jungle instead of like a beefy champion like an Amumu. When they have a relatively squishy team comp, like I would say three or more squishy champions, and I have a lane in which I have a lot of kill pressure, I like to go Sword Switch Use and Hextech Alternator as a start, and you can literally one-shot everybody at level 6. It's insane, it's ridiculous how much damage this build does, and it's my personal favorite over the very popular Ionian Fiendish start. Now, if you go back to the Ionian Fiendish start, we would upgrade this into the very widely known popular standard build, Riftmaker Leandri's Deathcap Void. So this is the standard build that everybody likes to go. Again, this gives you HP, it gives you extra healing, this gives you HP, and ultimately with this ability has as well, you become this guy who has perma Qs, you do a good amount of consistent damage, you have an insane amount of healing, so you're this raid boss who just doesn't die and who does decent amount of damage. Now, it depends. If they have a lot of beefy champions, Leandris is amazing. But sometimes you just don't need it. I've noticed that, okay, most people go this build in every single game, but it's just not always optimal. What if you don't play versus beefy champions? What if we play against that team comp that I just talked about, where the enemy team has like three squishy champions or even more? Then I don't like to go Ionis Riftmaker Leandris because I could do so much more damage. So if I'm focusing on one-shotting people, I like to go the more burst build and I never, I almost, nobody does this build. It's ridiculous how few people do this build. It's just literally my favorite build. It's the best 1v9 build currently that there is on Vladimir. And it's because if you go against squishies, this is just super easy to do. You just blow them up. It's not even difficult. It's so, it's ridiculous that it becomes very funny to just blow up people and you don't have to do anything for it. Now, obviously this build here, the Riftmaker Leandris with Ionian Boost, this is again, it's a lot more easy to play. It's a lot more forgiving. You make a mistake, who cares? You have a lot of HP, you have a lot of ability haste, and you basically are unkillable because you also have a lot of healing. But therefore, it's not always the best um, setup. If you talk, if we talk about playing versus squishy comms, then going this is a lot better. Yes, if you make a mistake, you might die because it's not as forgiving. But if the enemies make a mistake, you might get a penta. That's the difference. So I like to go with this build a lot more. So this is currently my go-to build. You could replace Storm Search with Shadow Flame. I haven't tried it too much, but currently I believe that from my current experience, Storm Search is a lot more reliable than Shadow Flame. But I'm going to uh, experiment a little bit more with Shadow Flame as well in the future. Now, if you go Pan Boots and you go Hextech Alternator here, and we try to upgrade this into a um, Storm Search, for example, this is my go-to build. You are very, you go very hard on the Pan Boots, or like on the Pan, the uh, magical penetration um, side of things. And you have a lot of burst, you want that people, you are basically an assassin at this point. But ultimately, that's fine because it's your first item. You're not going to be team fighting a lot in this stage of the game. But obviously, for our second and third item, we have to think more about our role as Vladimir. We're not just that assassin who picks people off in a 1v1, we also want to team fight and kill entire teams. So we might need a bit more things that are more forgiving, like ability haste, where we have, oh, we, we screw up something while well, we have more ability haste so we can do our combo again or uh, we have more mobility and cosmic drive is an amazing item for that it's very gold efficient and it gives us all the stats we need to become also more relevant for team fights instead of just a 1v1 so slowly but surely we're going to turn this assassin build into a more team fight build with cosmic drive then obviously death cap after that for full team fight domination and then typically avoid stuff if you need to burst you could even go with shadow flame if they don't have a lot of magic resist but, or like Crypt Bloom, but typically I like to go Void Stuff because it scales the best. Now, there's also another build, and this is more what I like to call the Extremely Gold Efficient build. This is the build that is so cheap that it becomes extremely good. These, all these items, if you look at the AP items that are viable on Vladimir, and you would express in a percentage how gold efficient each item was, these three items are the most gold efficient items that are viable on Vladimir. So it's basically just a combination of all the most gold efficient items so that you become as strong as possible, as quickly as possible. So here we go Ionians into Cosmic Drive, or you could even go Morellos first into Cosmic Drive or just Cosmic Drive into Morellos. And now you might wonder, wait, didn't you say in the past that Morellos is useless on Vlad? Yes, but I feel like this season there has been a lot more healing, right? Especially with this new items under Sky and stuff like that. There has been so much healing into the game and a lot of champions who are strong nowadays are champions with healing like an Aatrox for example or Rixen Zhao and Morales is just so good for that. And why has it become a viable item on Vladimir? Well not because suddenly like there's more healing so we need to have more anti-heal. That's like a very small reason why but the main reason is it's 2.2k gold for this item. 
even if you don't need the healing, look at the stats that you get. 90 AP and 15 ability haste with this Grievous Wounds passive for 2.2k gold. I would even dare say that even if you don't need the healing, the enemy team doesn't have any healing, it's still a good item to buy because you get 90 AP and 15 ability haste for 2.2k gold. Now, if you buy this against a team comp with an Aatrox and a Soraka, it becomes even more gold efficient to a point where it's just ridiculous. So is Morella Nomicon this season currently with its current like price viable on Vladimir? 100% it is. And then obviously Crit Bloom. Not a lot of people buy Crit Bloom on Vladimir. I feel like a lot of people don't know what Crit Bloom is, what the difference is with Void. Well, Crit Bloom is basically an early Void stuff. You have to think of it like that. It gives you less ability power. It gives you less, less magic penetration than Void. But it also gives you some ability haste and a nice passive. And also for less gold than Void stuff. So this is 80 AP, 40% pen, 30% pen, 70 ability power, but 15 ability haste and a nice passive. And it's cheaper. So Crib Bloom, if you want to pick it up on Vladimir, I typically don't pick it up that much on Vladimir. Almost like the reason why I don't pick it up on Vladimir a lot of times is because it doesn't really make that much sense. The only thing about Vladimir is in the early game, you want to prioritize other things than percentage pen. And then at the point where you want to really invest into magic pen, it's already so late into the game that you want to go for the most amount of magic pen because that scales the best. Because in my opinion, because this gives you less magic penetration and less AP and more ability haste, and ability haste is obviously better in the early game than in the late game. So this is more of an early item, so a good second or third item. But on Vladimir, you typically don't really want to invest in percentage pen this early on. So then if you want to buy like percentage pen as your fourth item, you might as well go with the best scaling option because at that point, enemies will either already have magic resist or they will start investing into it. And then obviously having the most magic pen is going to be the best. So Void Soft definitely scales the best. Now, if you do go this build and you do go Crypt Bloom and you get to a full build, feel free to change your Ionian Boots into Pen Boots and feel free to change your Crypt Bloom into a Void Staff if you're full build and you have some extra gold. But currently, obviously, this is my favorite build and this is the build that I go against more tanky team comps. This is more of an experimental build that I like to go in the beginning of the season. And basically, since I like this build so much, I kind of stopped going this build, but it's definitely still viable. But then we have the Elite 500 build. I'm going to call it that because he started it 100% sure, or at least that's what I think, because I saw Elite 500 played for the first time. Now, the build that he goes is Ionian Boots into Riftmaker, and then he either goes immediately tank, or he goes like the component of Leandris, like Haunting Guys, into tank, or he completes his Leandris and then goes tank. Now you might think, why would you ever want to go tank on Vladimir? Like, what is this? Well, it's because the armor and the magic resist items are so strong and they're very gold efficient. They're extremely cheap. So what does this allow you? Al armor and magic resist, it allows you to become, to join mid game and even early game team fights and become ridiculously strong in those team fights. Because people don't have armor penetration in the early game. They don't have magic penetration in the early game. So you become extremely hard to kill. And if you combine that with a lot of healing with Vladimir's kit and Riftmaker and also consistent damage with like the Riftmaker and the Leandris, you have an insane amount of setup for mid-game domination. The only problem with this build is it doesn't scale that good. And also if your teammates are not performing well and you don't have a lot of damage in your team and you go this tank build, you might actually struggle with carrying the game. But this build is especially great when your teammates, when you have already like a full damage team comp and you don't have a lot of peel, you don't have a lot of tanks and the enemy team, like they have a lot of one kind of damage, like uh, AD, for example, then you could invest into a frozen heart. That's how I view it. And then you become quite strong. You become like ridiculously strong in the mid game or even the late, like uh, the early game already. But this build doesn't scale that well because in the later stage of the game, people build armor penetration, they build magic penetration and they will shred th through you no matter what. Even though you have those items, you will not be tanky enough. They will still like a Caitlyn with her passive and uh, armor penetration. She will just one tap you through this build. So it doesn't scale that great. You could go this build. Personally, I'm not that big of a fan of this build. I believe that this build and this build outperform the Elite 500 build at this point. Um, that's what I believe about it. So currently I go this build and I go this build. Is this build bad? No, I've tested it out in some games. It's ridiculously OP. But personally, I like to go these builds, one, one of these two builds in the majority of my games. All right, so from this point on, there will be some segments that are literally copy pasted from my previous Vladimir guide to this guide. 
The reason for that is that the information from my previous Valley Make Guides about these segments still uphold today and there's nothing to change about it except for some couple of side notes that I will mention today. I still want to include those segments even though they're the same information from my previous video because this video really counts. I really want to make this video the number one ultimate Vladimir knowledge guide. So before we listen to the combo guide that's going to follow in just a bit, there's a quick side note I want to mention that I've come to value a lot more by playing Vladimir in the higher elos in season 14. During the combo guide I will be talking about at some point about not using your E in the early stages of the lane phase. Now that's still true. It's typically not beneficial to spam your E in the early levels, however, especially when your opponent is pushing towards you, on the first couple of waves it's crucial that you try and prevent them from pushing in the wave under your turret. This way you can hold the wave on your side of the lane for as long as possible, which gives you a lot of benefits. Now in order to do this you might have to use your E on the entire wave already, even when you're just level 2 or level 3, and that's okay. So in gen generally speaking, it's not that good to use your E or spam your E in the early levels, but it's definitely very important and sometimes even crucial to use your E to contest the early wave prior to make sure that you can keep the wave as long as possible on your side of the lane instead of just letting it crash into your turret. Okay, that's it for the combo guide. Now you can listen to the actual information about the combo guide that's basically the same from my previous Vladimir guide. In terms of combos, there's not that much to say. During the laning phase, you don't want to E a lot because it costs a lot of health. So in the early game, you mainly look to get some cheeky Qs off. It can be interesting to know that you can cancel your Q animation by going into pool immediately after pressing Q. Another great tip is that whenever a minion is low, your opponent will often think that you'll use your Q to last hit a minion. Instead, walk up and last hit the minion with an auto attack and then try to Q your opponent. Something else I often do is when I walk up to Q my mid lane opponent and he walks backwards so I can't Q him, I act like I'm going to walk back by briefly clicking behind me and then clicking back towards my opponent. So I'm basically punishing my opponent's bad reaction time and spacing. Now sometimes you can obviously EQ enemies. Keep in mind that you should never release your E with your Q but you should always release E manually and then press Q right after like we discussed when we were looking at the abilities. As for the usage of your pool in early game combos, there is no usage. Obviously you can do an EWQ combo, but since both your E and W cost you a lot of HP, it's very likely that you're going to lose the trade, and on top of that your W is your only defensive tool, so you shouldn't just waste it for a quick trade. Now if you do end up using your W for a trade, try to W simultaneously underneath your opponent and the enemy minions to restore as much health as possible. Now once you're level 6, you unlock your main combo that will allow you to literally 1v9 games. The best 1v9 combo on Vladimir is flash into ult into EW and then you either get out or keep on trading with Q. This combo makes sure that people can't one tap you or cancel your E or even exhaust you. It's almost a zero counterplay combo. However, what I see a lot of people do is they charge E and then flash into R. That's bad for multiple reasons. Number one, while you're charging E, you give the enemies the time to damage you or even one shot you. 2. You give enemies the opportunity to cancel your E and number 3. After you've E flashed into R, you can't EW because obviously your E is on cooldown, so you either W underneath them, which doesn't do a lot of damage, or you wait for your E to come off cooldown again, but once again that's a window for enemies to kill you. And reason number 4, if you E flash you're only hitting the enemies that stand in front of their teammates, but if you EW you can pull underneath everybody and then release your E to hit the entire enemy team. And let me also stress that you can activate Ghost while charging E, which could actually be the difference between killing someone or barely being out of range and missing out on the kill. Now sometimes you can E into Flash into RQW, and this combo is good for picking off people over walls if you know that they don't have vision on you. If they don't have vision of you, they won't be able to cancel your E or kill you while charging, so this is one of the only situations where you can actually use this combo. Another situation where you can use this combo is to finish off people in lane by surprising them. If your mid lane opponent is low, you can act like you're using your E to clear the wave, but then at the very last second you flash on your opponent, finishing them off with your E. Keep in mind that against better players they will understand what you're about to do and you might have to fake E so you might have to charge E and fake that you're about to flash to burn their flash first and then you can do it again with your flash advantage. Also you can use rocket belt together with all these combos and you can use rocket belt while in pool. And last but not least I want to show you that you can proc face rush with the first part of your ultimate. This is not something you use an awful lot but you can use it a lot more than you actually would expect.
one. <laughs> One. Alright, so with the general game plan, just like with the combo guide, this segment will be completely copy pasted from a previous Vladimir guide to this guide. So all of the information still upholds, and the information that doesn't uphold, I'm going to talk about that right now. So the first remark I want to make is that in this segment I will talk about items like Night Harvester that aren't in the game anymore at this point. But that doesn't matter, because the information still upholds, it's just the item names that have changed. Instead of Night Harvester, you should think of Riftmaker, or you should think of something like a Cosmic Drive or a Storm Surge. It's the reason behind it that's important, not the names of the old items. Now, second of all, at some point I wrote down on the general game plan here that in the early game, you should focus on perfect CS and avoid fighting. Now, that's partially true. Yes, you should focus on perfect CS, but you shouldn't avoid fighting. I've come to notice that fighting is a lot of times very important. You want to take sometimes even bad trades so that you can out-sustain your opponent afterwards because you can just heal up with your Q and they don't have that kind of sustain in their kit. And now you either drain their HP bar or you drain their mana pool. Whatever it is, it's still going to be beneficial for you. So fighting is not always bad. Now, I knew that at the time as well. I just wrote it down to basically tell you guys that ideally, theoretically, you should avoid fighting and you should skill. This is better for the new Vladimir players, the people who are not that used to Vladimir. But ultimately, fighting shouldn't be avoided. You should just be smart with your fighting. Don't trade when your, when your opponent has all their abilities up. But when they waste their abilities and they miss their key abilities like Ari misses her charm, go ahead and look for a trade. Don't just avoid fighting because your champion isn't weak. And then a last thing that I'm pretty sure that I don't mention in this segment is something that I found out about in Season 14 here, is that especially in the mid game, a lot of Vladimir players that I coach, they tend to side lane too long. Like when you get out of base and you have three items including your death cap. So you recalled, you just got your death cap, you bought it in base, they have summoner spells, they have ult, they will go back to the bot lane or the top or the top lane to side lane and push out the waves. Don't. Especially if you play like below master or even in master. If you're this strong, you know you can carry team fights, just go mid lane with your team. Don't just try to fight immediately. Try to get as close as possible towards the enemy nexus. So push the waves until the first turret. Push as far as possible towards the enemy side of the map and then you force a fight. If you know you're strong enough, that's when you should do this. Then you should win the fight and since you fought so closely to the enemy nexus, you probably have enough time while the enemies are dead to just take a turret, take an inhibitor, take the nexus turret and kill the nexus. Whereas if you take a fight in the mid lane, very close to your side of the map, by the time you get to the enemy nexus, the enemies might already have respawned and now you can't end. So this is a neat trick that I've kind of developed in season 14, is that whenever I'm strong enough, especially in like master, like low master or below master, instead of side laning, when I'm super strong, I just go mid lane, try to push as deeply as possible, then take a fight that I know I'm gonna win. And now since we're this close to the Nexus, we can just end the game while the enemies are dead. So that's something I quickly wanted to mention as well, because I'm pretty sure you're not gonna understand that from the uh, video itself, because this is copy pasted from last guide, and I probably didn't mention it in there. That's about it for the general game plan, so now have fun and watch the general uh, game plan information. In the early game, you want to prioritize getting CS and setting up good wave mechanics instead of perma trading and joining fights. 
Basically, every time you complete a full item, like Night Harvester, Death Cap, Void Stuff, you have a very big power spike that you should use to win fights. Too often do I see Vlad players during my coachings get an early Night Harvester because they're farming well, but then they don't do anything with it. They just sit back in lane and keep on farming. You have to use your power spikes. This is absolutely crucial. So if you just came out of base with your mythic item before your mid lane opponent and you have both your sums up, please look to start a Harold fight or a dragon fight, look to dive the enemy bot lane or just look to invade the enemy jungler. Scaling doesn't mean sitting back, doing nothing and giving up every objective for the first 30 minutes of the game. Scaling means that you can't fight and contest as much as other champions can in the early stage of the game, but you can still fight around your power spikes. On top of that, you can also do objective trading. If the enemy team is doing dragon and Harold is up, don't just sit back mid because you're scaling. No, try to shove the wave, take a couple of turret plates and get that Harold. Scaling means that you can still be proactive on the map, but you need to be smart about it and put pressure at the right times. And don't get me wrong, this is by far the hardest thing to balance for any Vlad player. It's not easy to balance scaling and being proactive on the map. But the best way to find a balance between this is by playing off item power spikes, specifically when you're playing Vladimir. Most scaling champions are level dominant, meaning that they need to scale to a certain level to become all powerful, for example Kale and Cassidy at level 16. Vladimir is gold dominant instead of level dominant. Being level 16 on Vlad doesn't give you any crazy stats, but having Night Harvester, Deathcap and Void Staff at 25 minutes does. So the goal of Vlad is focusing on CS early on, playing off of fresh item power spikes and team fighting. Team fighting is the key to winning games with Vlad. Too often do I see Vlad players flash ghost ult for the enemy mid laner 30 seconds before dragon spawns. If the enemy can respawn in time for dragon, the enemy has a big advantage because you're a walking minion because you wasted your summoner spells 30 seconds ago. And even if that mid laner that you killed won't be able to get to dragon fight in time, you'll still be useless in that fight and it will basically be a 4 versus 4. So I want you to ask yourself the following question. Do you prefer to fight a 5 versus 4 in your team's advantage but you're basically going to be useless? Or do you prefer fighting a 5 versus 5 but you're a dominant AoE force at its strongest because you have your summoner spells up? You should always go for the second scenario. Don't bother picking off one person when you have the strength to pentakill the entire enemy team. You do not win games by picking off people on Vlad, you win them by forcing the enemy team to teamfight and then just running over them. In fact, a lot of the time when I have an angle to pick someone off before an important fight, I won't. I won't because that could cause the enemy team to give up the objective because they might not feel comfortable fighting a 4 vs 5. But I don't want that. I don't want a dragon. I want a 5 vs 5 dragon fight that results in me killing the entire enemy team, getting that dragon, and because all the enemies are dead, I can also take towers and inhibitors. So it all comes down to this. During the laning phase, you want to focus on CS. But you can look to make proactive plays when you have an item power spike and at least one of your summoner spells is off cooldown. After the laning phase, you want to go side lane to get solo gold and solo XP. And after shoving out the side lane, you can look to join a fight or create fights around objectives and win them by using your summoner spells and ultimate properly. Afterwards, you can go side laning again and wait for your summoner spells and ultimate to be off cooldown again. If that's the case, you can look to join or create fights again. You just repeat this process over and over again until you get to the enemy nexus. When playing Vladimir, you can have two type of matchups in the laning phase. The first one being range versus range and the second one being range versus melee. Let's start with a range versus range scenario. Typically in these type of matchups, both players will just perma clear waves and look to establish mid prio. However, even though Vladimir is a range champion, he's relatively short range compared to contra mages and his high cooldowns and lack of mobility aren't helping him. So a range versus range matchup when playing Vladimir is not that similar to a standard range versus range matchup because contra mages can easily abuse you in lane or shove you in and move onto the map. The way you can prevent both these things from happening is by freezing the wave in front of your turret. This way, your mid lane opponent has to overstep to CS and thus he's viable to ganks from your jungler or all ins from you as Vlad. However, pre 6 it will be hard to freeze your lane opponent, but once you get your fiendish codex and especially once you have your ultimate, you should be able to freeze most lane opponents. Now, if you're playing versus a melee matchup like Silas for example, then you're playing range versus melee. Since you're the range champion, you can poke your lane opponent and establish lane prio, especially on the first couple of waves. This means that you could do a 2 wave or a 3 wave crash and while doing so, poking your mid lane opponent. After you've done that, you can let the wave push towards you and look to freeze it. You definitely don't want to be on the melee champion side of the map because almost all melee champions have an easy time all inning you, especially when you're Vladimir. 
All right, so just as with the previous parts, like the combo guide, the general game plan, the lane phase game plan, the common mistakes plus tips and tricks segment here will also be copy pasted from my previous Vladimir guide. Again, simply because that information mainly still upholds to this date. However, there are two side notes, two additional things that I want to add to make this updated to season 14. Once you get at number five, you will learn about that. I wrote down there that going an aggressive setup on Vladimir should not be done with the focus for solo kills, but rather with the focus to help your aggressive jungler like a Nidalee or something with early skirmishes. Because if you play something like a Nidalee, you need to be able to do something in the early game and snowball or your champion is useless. Otherwise, you will get outskilled very easily. So as a Vladimir, it's very important to support your uh, jungler and support even and let them roam onto the map, let them do what they want to do. And therefore, you might have to go an aggressive setup. However, I'm here to add that, especially with my newfound experience in Season 14, it's very okay to also go an aggressive setup with the aim of solo killing your opponent. Now, I knew this back at the time as well. The only way why I wrote it down like this is that people wouldn't lose sight of the big picture and go way too ham on the aggressiveness. But it's definitely okay to go an aggressive setup with the aim of going for solo kills because getting a solo kill gives you an initial lead and that initial lead allows you to scale stronger to dominate those team fights. But that's how you should view it. A solo kill leads to quicker scaling and that leads to better domination of those team fights. Don't get lost in all of the aggressiveness and overforce things in the early game. If you can do that, then it's very okay to focus on solo kills as long as you can keep sight of the general game plan of Vladimir. Now, on top of that, there's a second thing I want to add, and that's about number eight that you will encounter in just a bit. And number eight, I wrote down that a lot of people make the mistake of not forcing a recall when they have en enough gold for Fiendish Codex, which is 900 gold. Now, obviously, since this is from last season, this season, there are some more alternatives. You could wait until you have 1.1k gold for your sorcery shoes. Or instead of Finnish Codex, you could build you could build um, Ionian Boots. Or you could go for a Hexac Alternator on your first base. Or you could even go for an Amplifying Tome with a Dark Seal. There are multiple options right now and instead of just that Finnish Codex, specifically in Season 14. What you have to understand here is that it doesn't really matter what you pick up. It's more that you do have to pick something up in the early game. It's not okay to just chill in lane and have 3k gold. Now it depends on the situation, but let's say you're playing versus a Victor and you've come at a point in the lane where the Victor has no mana and you know if you recall, he will also have a recall timer and then he will be back in lane with full mana and he might actually be able to abuse you and poke you and annoy you. So a lot of people, due to that reason, they keep him in lane and they just farm and they think, hey, I have free scaling. And in some games that's true. But what if you're in a game where the enemy top lane Renekton or the enemy bot lane Draven, they are snowballing really hard and they're consistently denying your bot lane minions or your top lane minions or they're destroying your bot and top lane, they're diving them, they're getting double kills, stuff like that. In those games, it's not enough to just sit back in lane and say, oh, I'm outscaling this uh, Victor anyway because he's in lane, he has no mana, he can't contest me and I'm outscaling him, so this is great. Well, yes, you might outskill the enemy team, but this Draven might become so fat that by the time you finally fully skilled and got to three items, he already finished the game. So in those games where you see that the enemy team, the side lanes or the jungler is snowballing, be very aware of that and force some early recalls to make sure that you can impact the game as quickly as possible. Maybe if you didn't sit in lane with 3k gold and you recall that like 1.1k gold, you picked up sorcery shoes, maybe that would have allowed you to get the prio in lane, to move to the bot site and shut down the 2-0 Draven instead of letting him get to 5 kills and now he's unkillable. So that's the thing that you have to understand about this concept. But with that being said, enjoy the common mistakes plus tips and tricks segment. But one, not knowing when to build magis. There are two situations when you can or should buy magis. Number one, you can buy Magi's when you're snowballing, but it's important that you're not the only strong member on your team. Because if you're the only strong member on your team and you put all your gold in the Magi's, you're basically just coin flipping the game. Number two, you can also buy Magi's when the game is going very bad and if the game basically looks doomed, then Magi's is a perfect item because Magi's might actually be the only miracle thing that could get you back into this game, so it might be a great option to go for. Point number two, not syncing up your summoner spells. Having Flash or Ghost up is nice, but having both of them can actually be game changing. So whenever you have a summoner spell up and your second summoner spell is about to come up in let's say 30 seconds and Dragon spawns for example in 40 seconds, then you have the opportunity to have both sums up for that Dragon fight. 
However, what I see a lot of people do, they will randomly burn their flash for a kill that doesn't even matter, and now they have to fight a dragon fight with only one summoner spell instead of two, which could actually be game changing. Number three, always fighting front to back. A lot of flat players, even when they have two sums up, they will choose to ghost flash past the entire enemy frontline with the chance of getting CC'd or killed in the process just to get to the enemy backline. Instead, they should buy control wards and play around vision to flank the enemy backline. This way they don't risk getting themselves killed or CC'd as much. Number 4, not playing around sustain. Almost every single Vlad player doesn't fully optimize his sustain. Vlad's Q gives him a lot of healing which allows him to control lanes that he shouldn't be able to control when used properly. A lot of the time when I coach Vlad players I see them playing safe with full HP. Being full HP on Vlad is literally one of the worst things you could do. You literally have zero benefit from your sustain because there's nothing to heal because you're full HP. Instead, look to trade with your opponent and then use your sustain to heal up from the minions or jungle camps and repeat this process. Also, even if you're getting low in lane, feel free to ult your lane opponent just to get some health back. Number 5, going electrocute or airy plus ignite for solo kills. You can definitely get solo kills with electrocute or airy, but that's not the main reason why you sometimes want to go it on Vlad. You mainly go electrocute or airy plus ignite when you think your jungler will force scuttle fights or early skirmishes in general early on into the game. Your rather aggressive rune and summoner spell setup allows you to keep your lane opponent in lane. You basically get more early lane control which can be useful if you have an early game jungler like Lee Sin, Elise or Nidalee. Number 6, not thinking enough about enemy sustain. This is a big one. I rarely see people do this. Once you're in loading screen, you can literally OPTG your live game and literally check the enemy's runes. This way you can check what kind of sustainability they have. For example, if you're playing versus an Akali and you see in her runes that she has second wind, then there's a big chance that she will go de-shield. Now killing an Akali, as Vlad, in early game when the Akali has a Doran shield plus second wind is actually unrealistic, so you shouldn't even bother trying to kill her. So don't go Doran's ring, but instead opt for Doran's shield or Dark Seal. Number 7, not using enough potions against assassins. I see this a lot specifically with Vladimir players. Vladimir players tend to wait way too long with using their potions against assassins. I think it's because they want to heal up with Q and greed to not have to use their potions, but if you're playing versus let's say a LeBlanc, a Zed Akali, you need to use your potions in time or you will literally be one tapped. Number 8, not forcing a recall when you have enough gold for Fiendish Codex. A lot of people think that you only need to force a recall when you're in a bad spot, but this is wrong. Once you have the gold for Fiendish Codex, you should look to reset and you can even use ult to force a reset if needed. You need Fiendish to start being proactive on the map and as long as you don't have that, you're basically useless. Number 9, accidentally breaking freezes by tanking too much minion damage. When you have a freeze but you're standing too close to the enemy wave, the wave will start to attack you and that can literally break your freeze. So be sure to not tank too much minion damage. Number 10, perma freezing when winning your lane. And this is probably the worst mistake you could make on Vlad, and yet almost every single Vladimir player out there does this. When you're winning lane, you shouldn't be perma freezing. Freezing is extremely good in the early levels, but after the early laning phase is over, it's not that good anymore. Instead, try to impact the map with your lead instead of freezing your opponent. There's so much more you could actually be doing. You could use your mid prior to secure Dragon or Herald, invade enemy jungler, take his jungle camps, dive bot or top, or dive mid and take third place, etc. Number 11. Not knowing when to go blue trinket or sweeper. Blue trinket is great for side laning and not having to face check bushes. However, if you're fat and the enemies don't have a lot of CC, you can use sweeper to clear vision and find flank angles in teamfights. If you have blue trinket, you need to buy control wards to find flank angles in teamfights. Number 12. Buying too many control wards. You need every single source of gold on Vlad, so don't just waste it on control wards if you can't use or protect them. For example, if you're perma freezing, then putting a control ward down is not gonna do a lot. Also, you only need a control ward for crucial moments in the game, for example, to find a flank angle in a game deciding Baron fight. Number 13, doing the wrong all in combo. It's essential that you use the following combo for 1v9 in team fights flash into R into EW. Number 14, Viewing Conqueror as a late game rune setup. Conqueror is actually great for early fist fighting, for example at level 1 to 4, and it is good in mid game skirmishes and team fights, but Face Rush is still by far the best scaling rune setup, especially if you want to win team fights. Number 15, using E in the early game to trade or farm minions. 
And the early game, charging your E costs you a lot of HP that you can't miss, so you shouldn't do it too often. On top of that, your E has a high cooldown and a lot of Vladimir players do not respect that. I often see them in a situation where they need to hard shove a wave, but they used E to last at 1 minion and now they can't hard shove the wave because of the E high cooldown. Number 16, having a weak and toxic mentality. I literally don't understand how so many Vlad players completely lose it when their team is behind or when they die once themselves. You're literally playing one of, if not the best scaling champion in the game, so sometimes you're just going to be playing from behind, shit happens, but I'd rather play from behind while I'm playing a champion that actually scales to ridiculous levels, than that I'm playing from behind with LeBlanc, who can't even one-shot a Yumi when she's behind. Number 17, let it be known for now and always, you cannot dodge tethers by going into pool. Once you're hit by a tether, like LeBlanc chain, you can't dodge it with pool, it will stun you in pool and you will still take the damage. And against Klet, it also pulls you back towards him, even if you're in pool. And last but not least, number 18, please stop using your pool like it's on a minus 3 second cooldown and costs no HP. I'd literally rather die by waiting too long to use my pool, than create a bad habit of always pooling early, because that will get you killed 10 times more. Okay guys, so specifically for you guys, just for you, I made this matchup tier list, because personally, I don't really care about it. I know a lot of you guys put a lot of value to matchup tier lists, but honestly, I don't really care. Because whether I'm in a hard matchup or in an easy matchup, I will always try my best to win the lane and to win the game, obviously. And I notice that when I coach people and they notice that they're in a hard matchup, they get tilted by the fact that theoretically it's a difficult matchup, even though they're playing versus like an Iron and Nivea. So these matchups and these tier lists are very dependent on the elo that you play in, they're very dependent on the jungle matchups that you play in, the support matchups. It depends on a lot of factors, it depends on your playstyle. So these matchups depend on a lot of factors, so it's not always easy to put a certain champion into a certain tier. But obviously some matchups are harder than others, and that's all you need to know. You just need to know how to play in those matchups. So I'm going to give you guys a very quick and brief breakdown about every single matchup here. This might be like one sentence or one thing, uh, I'm not going to cover all of them very in depth, that would take me ages to do so, but we'll go about them. Um, in like very briefly. Now take into account, yes they are ordered in tier, but within the same tier there is no order. It's just random. For example here in the very difficult tier, it's not because Anivia is like in front of Karma that therefore it's a harder matchup than Karma. So there's no order within the tier. They're just ordered based on tier and that's it. Alright, so let's get started. So the first matchup here, let's start with the most difficult matchups. We have Anivia, Karma, Nico and Rise. Anivia is a very hard matchup, but it's playable pre-6, because you can just pull her Q. If she hits her Q and then an E, auto attack, she gets electrocuted, you don't want to get that, so you want to pull either her Q if you can, or just um, yeah, dodge the Q. Now, after 6, that's when this matchup becomes hard. Why? Um, even if you dodge the Q with pull, she can just press her ult, and now she can also E, get the empowered E off, and you will take a shit ton of damage. So it becomes a very difficult matchup. Um, typically you can't really go fist fight heavy runes in this matchup, so you need to go full scaling, go second wind, revitalize, phase rush, go for the scaling game. Then we have Karma. I believe Karma has never been this strong before in the mid lane. Season 14 just made Karma completely broken and busted, so it's a very difficult matchup. Back in Season 13 I felt like you could go something like Conqueror or Ares Scorch with Ghost Ignite and just beat the shit out of her, like at least match her. Nowadays you can't. I've tried, you can't. It's very difficult if you're playing versus a good Karma. It's almost impossible to kill her with an aggressive setup. So just go with the scaling setup, go face rush, go perhaps even nullifying orb with second wind revitalize and play the scaling game. The same goes for Nico. very hard to fist fight. It's pure torture honestly, there's nothing you can do about it really. It's again going full scaling, not going aggressive. Then we have Ryze. Um, Ryze could honestly be into the heart here, because I don't think the matchup is that unplayable. However, I feel like a lot of the Rise mains, especially the higher Eidos, you don't see that many Rise mains, uh, or like you don't see that many Rise players. But once you see a Rise, that's mainly when they're a main, because Rise is not really that good into the meta. So whenever you see a Rise, they're probably a Rise main. And that makes it a little bit more difficult, because if you play against a Rise who really knows what he's doing, the matchup becomes quite difficult. But most Rises in the lower Eidos are not that good. So that's why you could put him into the hard or the skill matchup tier even, um, sometimes even easy. But if you play versus a Rise and he knows what he's doing, he's very aware of the fact that he slightly arranges you, it becomes a very difficult matchup. 
Now, if you go to the hard matchups, we have Azir. Azir is a very difficult matchup, I would say. You could go fist fight set up into Azir. That's what makes it a not unplayable matchup. It's a hard matchup, but not unplayable. Because you can go fist fight and actually just beat the shit out of him with either Conqueror or Airy Scorch and D-Ring. And it's very important uh, against Azir that whenever he queues with the soldier, you need to stand next to the wave. So that when he queues you, now his soldier is not in range anymore to farm your minion wave. So now you can walk up, you can farm whatever you want to, and you can also walk up and take a trade with him because his soldiers are next to the wave. So he can't use the range of his soldiers to farm right now. So now he needs to walk up manually with his auto attacks, and that's your window basically to um, attack him. Azir is also very all inable at level 6, you just have to pull his ult and then everything is fine. Um, so it's a hard matchup, but it's definitely playable. Then we have Cass Cassiopeia. Against Cassiopeia, it's almost unplayable if you're against a very good Cassiopeia. But if you do rush boots, you have a lot of counterplay. I would definitely advise going Ionian boots in the early game against Cassiopeia. It gives you more sustain and more movement speed to dodge those cues, and then you're fine. Typically what I've noticed is if that you start trying to fist fight the Cassiopeia, you will typically end up on the bad side of things because it's a lot easier for her to run you down than the other way around. So just chill and whenever she gets out of mana or whenever she misses a Q, look for an opportunity to take a very short trade, but don't look to make extended trades. Also a nice tip is that when a Cassiopeia tries to Q you, they will typically just assume that you will walk behind, like you will walk towards your turret. You will try to dodge the Q by walking backwards. Whereas a lot of times I try to bait them, I try like since I know that they think that, instead of walking backwards to dodge the Q, I walk towards the Cassiopeia and now they missed the Q and I'm closer to them so I have a very small and easy opportunity to trade with them and then I just get out. Then we have Irelia. I think Irelia is fine in the early levels, like level 1, 2, 3, maybe even 4, 5. You can definitely trade with her, especially in the mid lane. This lane isn't super long so she can't really run you down that easily. And you definitely do a lot of damage, so I would definitely advise you to go something like Ignite Ghost, or when you go Ghost Flash, at least go something like Airy Scorch or Conqueror, and then you might have some kill pressure. The only problem with Irelia, like I think it's more of a skill matchup in the mid lane, and top lane I would say it's a hard matchup, but I would still put Irelia in the hard matchup even though you play against her mid lane, because in the mid game and in the late game, she might go something like a Bork and a Witsend, and then she's basically the unkillable Demon King. Bork champions just destroy Vladimir, and if they go with Sand as well, it becomes absolutely unplayable, and that's exactly what Irelia likes to build against you. So in the early game, it's difficult, but it's fine, it's manageable, but in the mid and late game, it can become a living hell to side lane against an Irelia. So definitely, I would say, a hard matchup. Then we have LeBlanc. I think LeBlanc is a very hard matchup. Um, you have to dodge her E, so pull her E. If you can do that, then it's fine. Also, I advise you not to go scaling into LeBlanc, but to go aggressive with Airy Scorch. I really like that setup, and then it becomes a little bit more playable. It becomes even a skill matchup, I would say. But if you go like full scaling, she will just literally abuse you. Um, if you don't like dodge her E once, you lose your entire HP bar. So therefore, it's very important that you go aggressive and that you try to always think of her E usage. And against LeBlanc, don't ever fall for the trap where if your minions are low and you position behind your minions and you think that you're safe, she can just double you onto the low minions. Now your minions are dead and now she can freely hit her E onto you. Never fall for that. All right. Then we have the Lissandra matchup. Lissandra is almost unkillable. Um, you can't ult her because she just ult herself. Also, it's very hard to get onto her with her CC, with her W and her E and her ult. She also has quite some good wave clear, so she can also decide to just keep you under your turret and roam. I wouldn't say it's that hard of a matchup, but if she has a good jungler that's constantly hovering her, it becomes unplayable because she will just perma shove you under tower, you don't have any kill pressure onto her, and now she just moves onto the map. Also, even if she doesn't do that, even if she doesn't have a great jungler, but the bot and top lane and her team are really performing, it's very hard to kill her. So it's very difficult to say, oh, I'm gonna shove in this Lissandra and help my side lanes, because she has a lot of wave clear, and also it's very hard to solo kill her, so that might become a bit of a drag as well. That's why I would put Lissandra into the hard matchup. Then we have Orianna. Orianna is honestly one of the worst matchups you could ever face, but I've noticed that most Orianna players are really really bad at this game. They either pick it to counter pick you, or they're just in generally not good enough to play the champion. And then at level 6 you have a lot of all-in potential. Now once they have lost chapter, typically this matchup becomes unplayable, but with the new Ionian boots, like how cheap they are, and then you just go Ionian into uh, Fiendish Codex, I think you have a lot of sustain against Orianna. So the matchup, it should be really really bad, but a lot of Ariana players are very bad as well. And you have a pretty decent setup with Ionian Boots and Finnish Codex to a point where it actually becomes manageable, this matchup. And sometimes it's just even easy, right? If you don't play against a very good Oriana and there aren't that many good Orianas, I notice, it becomes even easy. But I'm going to put it in hard because it's kind of illegal to put it in easy, you know? 
All right, then we have the Rumble matchup. I think Rumble matchup top lane is near impossible. It's possible, but it's very difficult in the mid lane. Just like Irelia matchup, he can't run you down as easily. So I think it's a lot more fine. I would say it's maybe even a skill matchup. It's not that um, difficult at the moment. I felt like, I feel like Rumble has been stronger in the past. Uh, but I'm going to put it in hard because if you make one mistake, you miss pool once, you're just dead. If he makes one mistake, he's not dead. That's the only reason why I put it in hard. It's a lot more forgiving the matchup for him than it is for you. Then we have Syndra. Syndra used to be one of your hardest matchups, if not your hardest matchup. But um, in season 14, she is not that strong anymore. So Syndra is not that, not that strong anymore. She's not that good at lane bullying you anymore. So she's not weak. It's not an easy matchup, um, but it's definitely not an ultra hard matchup anymore. It's definitely manageable. So I would put it either in skill matchup or hard. I'm going to put it in hard because if you play against a really good Syndra, the matchup still is quite difficult. But in lower elos, if you play against like an Emerald Syndra or something, you're going to have an easy time. Now we have Twisted Fate. Twisted Fate, I would say, is never easy because he counters you, right? He can just outroam you. And you can counter him by just perma shoving him. The moment he gets a name at level 6, you just ult him, get him low HP. Yes. But what if he has a jungler who just ganks you, gets you low, or a jungler who allows him to push in the wave and now he gets to roam for free? You might think, well, this never happens in my platinum games or silver games. Well, if you play in high elo, that might happen. And that's why this is a very difficult matchup. Because it depends on the jungle matchup. If he has a good jungler, it becomes very difficult. Also, the new ADTF is a lot more of a difficult lane than the like uh, APTF from previous season. So I think that's why I would put it in hard. The laning phase has become a little bit more rough and it's always a counter to you. Not in the 1v1, but more in the grand scheme of things. Then we have the Victor. Victor matchup is always hard. He can obviously poke you from a distance, uh, from a distance. But what you want to do is you want to drain out his mana bar or his HP with your sustain. So you can actually go not the scaling setup. You could actually go like Airy Scorch or Conqueror with Revitalize Second Wind, for example, and basically just beat him. Take very nasty traits, level one, level two, level three, and then just heal up and basically out sustain him. That's a very nice way to go about it. Now, if you want to have more the phase rush approach the more scaling approach against a victor you can definitely do that as well just make sure that you don't always tank his q and empowered auto attack it's okay to tank his q but not the empowered auto attack and since the q has more range than the empowered auto attack you can just bait him into queuing you at max range and then you just walk away and if he does that he doesn't have the damage like not the mana pool to kill you with his damage in the early game then we have Zoe. Zoe is a very hard matchup in my opinion, but honestly, I haven't even seen her in season 14. For some reason, this champion is dead, but this has always been a very hard matchup. So for now, I'm just going to leave it there, but I haven't even played against Zoe in season 14. Then we have Akshan. Akshan is always very difficult to play against because it's almost impossible to 1v1 this guy. You do have some kill pressure on him at level 6 if you play it correctly, but it's very difficult, especially if he has Ignite. And also he can just, from very early on into the game, just perma shove you in and get out. And even if your jungler comes, he just swings out with the E, he's safe, and he just does all of that all over again when your jungler is top or bot. So it becomes very difficult to play against Akshan. He either kills you or if you play it really good, you might somewhat survive and somewhat contest him, but he can always just outroam you. And for some reason, nobody knows Akshan can get invisible. They all fall for it and they just get free kills all over the map. So um, I hate this matchup. I hate Akshan. So definitely a hard matchup. Then we have Brand. I would say Brand is very annoying in the sense that he can literally just WE on your backline minions and you will basically get hits even though you stand in Narnia. You could stand in your own base. He could E or like WE a minion in the midwave and you're still going to get hit in your base. That's how much range this guy has. Brand is also extremely strong in team fights, so you have to blow him up. In laning phase though, after level 6, you do have all-in potential on him. That's why it's not a very hard matchup, it's just normally hard. But a good brand can definitely poke you and make your life miserable, um, especially pre-level 6. That's why I put it in hard. Then we have a Lux. A Lux, a very good Lux, is a very difficult matchup. And she has multiple options. She can go for making your life miserable pre-6. And then after level 6, she can just perma shove you in and move on to the map. Now... Lux isn't that good for roams. That's why I wouldn't put her in like unplayable tier. Because even if she shoves you in, she typically can't do that much in terms of roams and stuff like that. But she's always very annoying to you. That's why I put it in the heart. It's very difficult for you to kill a Lux player. So most Lux players also go something like Barrier. That makes it very annoying to kill her. So just solo killing this champion, like every single matchup that I struggle with solo killing, or that's very little chance of me solo killing her, I will put them most of the time in hard. Because if the enemy team is doing well in the top and bot lane, I don't have much counterplay because I can't really solo kill the looks. And I can't also roam because she can just shove me in under my turret as well. 
Then we have Galio. Galio is a very hard champion. Again, he has a lot of wave clear, extremely hard to kill him, and he has actually a surprising amount of kill pressure onto you, which makes it quite difficult. Um, so that's why I don't like this matchup. Then we can move on towards the skill matchup tier. Uh, basically, every single skill matchup you can outplay it mechanically. Let that be clear. So first of all, we have Heimerdinger. Heimerdinger is difficult. Why? He just perma shifts you in under third, and there's nothing you can do about it. He just takes plates. He also skills ridiculously well. Only benefit is you don't really see him that often. He doesn't get picked that much. And also, most Heimerdinger players are not that good. So it's definitely outplayable mechanically. You can definitely surprise them, especially at level 6. Pre-6 against a decent Heimerdinger, you're not going to kill him. You can try all you want, but you're not going to kill him. Then we have a Diana. I think Diana is also a skill matchup. Um, I think it's fine. You can pull her ult, but she does have a ridiculous amount of damage. So if you ever screw up your pull, the matchup is over. She can just kill you. She can get you from 100 to 0, especially if she has ignite. But most Diana mid lane players do go ignite, so that makes the matchup even harder. Then we have Aurelian Sol. I think Aurelian Sol is really fine. The problem is he is turbo strong right now. At this moment of making this video, he is extremely strong. He's like sitting at 57% win rate in the mid lane. He's turbo strong. The thing is with Aurelian Sol that if you don't fight him early on as Vladimir, you should be fine and you outscale him anyway. But I feel like he's so strong that right now, if there's like a void group fight and he goes there, he gets a double kill. That's how strong he is. So that's why I'm going to put him in skill matchup. It's not always easy. You can definitely not fight him pre-6. Or you can, but you need to take short trades. It becomes difficult. And after six, you might get to one tap him, but you have to be very careful of his Q damage because it's ridiculous right now. That was like your main strength in previous seasons, where in the early lane, he is a lot stronger than you. But starting from level six on, you actually become a lot stronger than him in the 1v1. But the problem is, nowadays, he's so strong with his Q damage, it's ridiculous that it even after six becomes quite a difficult matchup. So I would say skill matchup definitely are playable, but a lot more difficult than the previous season. Then we have Annie. A good Annie can zone you from the minions, actually. She can be very annoying. Uh, you want to avoid trading with her uh, in the early game. And basically this matchup is a lot harder than most people expect. So definitely keep an eye out for it. Most Annie players aren't that smart though. That's why I put it in skill matchup, because you can almost always outplay an Annie player, but a very good one. I would even consider to put any matchup into hard or even in the unplayable uh, tier because it does become unplayable. It, it becomes very, very difficult to play against any against a very good one. But I've almost never, ever faced a very good any. So that's why I put it in skill matchup. Then we have Akali. Akali is basically, I don't know, it, it feels like this champion is unkillable. I've played a lot of Akali myself and it feels like Akali is un unkillable basically. And she has skill pressure onto you starting from level 6 mainly. So you always have to keep, a, keep an eye out for this champion. It's very obvious what she wants to do, but she does do a ridiculous amount of damage. So you still have to keep an eye out. If you fuck up once, you misplay with your pool and she can all in you, you're just dead. It's a lot harder to kill an Akali than that she can kill you because she has a lot more mobility than you. And that makes it difficult. After, like, I would say, in team fights, obviously, you heavily outscale her. But in laning phase, especially level 7, beware of getting killed, right? Play it safe. Don't, like, you can take trades, but it's very straightforward what she wants to do. But you might be surprised by her damage. So always pull the second part of her E. You can get hit by the first E. Never try to pull the first part of the E. Always try to pull the second part of the E. All right. And then after six, it becomes very difficult because if you pull the Ish, you might still all in you with ult. So you might not be too far up in the lane. So you always have to be careful of this matchup. Then we have Echo. Um, I don't know. Echo mid, most of the time, they're pretty good, right? Um, you don't see too many Echo mid players, but one like when you see Echo mid players, they're typically mains and they're not that bad. Um, against Echo, it's very crucial that you bully them early on. They're not that strong early on. Some Echoes might start um, E into you or uh, yeah, most of the time, actually, they do if they're a good Echo. And it's very important that you basically always try to pull their E because once they get onto you, it becomes very difficult, right? It's a very difficult matchup. Be aware, you can easily get surprised by his damage, uh, but you have to try and bully him early on because after level six, he becomes quite impossible to kill. Then we have Kastin matchup. I don't know. This could even be a hard matchup because Kastin doesn't outscale you, but he can easily outpace you in terms of scaling. Kastin has more mobility with his ult starting from level six. So if he has somewhat of a good jungler that can play around him, help him shove out waves and he can get onto your bot lane, like he can get there so much faster than you that it's so easy to get some a couple of kills on Kastin, meaning that he can snowball, like outpace you in terms of scaling. He can't outscale you, but he can be stronger at some moments if he just outscales you, like outpace paces you in scaling and I feel like due to his mobility and burst he's a lot better at that than a Vladimir. Now pre-6 you win this matchup very very easily if you play it well but most Vlad uh, Kasten players especially since fleet is so strong right now they just go fleet with second wind and they have so much sustain nowadays that it also becomes more of a skill matchup pre-6 and then after 6 I feel like Kasten has the upper hand um, depending on the build 
and uh, also because of his snowball potential. So you could potentially put this champion into the heart matchup, but typically I can pre-6, I can abuse them quite a bit, and then I have the upper hand for the rest of the game if I just keep on farming. Then we have the Malzahar matchup. Malzahar matchup could be hard. Personally, I feel like Malzahar's, Malzahar players have like two IQ. They're not really good. They try to perma shove. If you time your E with their W, you should be able to contest their push quite a bit. Also, pre-6, you can abuse him. So try to kill, try to play as aggressive as possible against the Malzahar um, pre-6. After 6, you have to be a bit more careful because especially if he has a good ganking jungler like a Sejuani or something, or even a jungler with burst like Elise or Talon, you might have to be careful if he ults you. Then we have Talon. Talon isn't that difficult, I would say. If you played correctly, I would even put it an easy matchup. But if you misplayed once against Talon with your pool, again, you're just dead. So it's not a super forgiving matchup. It's quite easy. It's not that hard. Like, it's not that easy to fuck it up. You just have to hold your pool. But if you screw it up once, you might just be dead. And that's why I'm going to put it in skill matchup. Then we have Silas. Um, Silas, a lot of people think this is a very hard matchup because they get overwhelmed by his aggressiveness. It's definitely not a hard matchup. I would say it's a skill matchup. If you go Conqueror, you can definitely face him. Um, consider going Oblivion Orb this season into Silas because, yes, Morello's is a viable option on Vladimir because it's 2.2k gold. That helps a lot in this matchup as well, going that Oblivion Orb, knowing that you can upgrade it into Morello's because it's 2.2k gold. So that's a very good option, helps a lot in this matchup. But obviously, the main thing in this matchup, you can W the Silas W. If you do that, you win. It's as simple as that. If he Ws onto you, you W the healing and the damage, then he's just... It's fine, like you just win 100%, especially if you go Conqueror or Airy Scorch. Because the W is a main part of his kit. You just have to get the timing right. That's it. It's a skill diff, right? Like I said, skill matchup. Then we have Tristana. I don't know about Tristana. I haven't played too much against Tristana, but I did want to include her because sometimes when I coach people, I get some questions about this matchup. So apparently Tristana gets picked in the lower elos a bit more than in the higher elos in the mid lane. I would say Tristana isn't that hard to play against. You can obviously, the second she like ease you, you can just pull. The only thing is if you mistime it, you might get screwed. So personally, I don't think it's that hard of a matchup. I've played against very few Tristana uh, players, but they were pretty good. They were high elo. So I would say from my experience, the matchup isn't that difficult. But obviously pre-6, you can easily get bullied. But after 6, it feels like pretty easy. Only problem is with this matchup, she can also choose to just perma push, take some plates or perma move. And then it becomes a bit scary. But if you can try and keep her in lane, everything is fine. Then Valkos. Valkos is a matchup that personally I really hate to play against. Uh, all the artillery mages are a little bit annoying in my opinion. They just stand at their turret, they constantly wave clear and move, or they just... Like, Valkos is this champion where if you want Smith's pool and he completely all you with EWQ ult, you're just dead. He can one-tap you, basically, if you uh, misuse your pool. So I wouldn't say it's that difficult against a Valkos if you play good around your pool, you get some free scaling. But if you do misplay with your pool once, he just gets to one-tap you, and I don't think that's fair. That's why I put him in skill matchup. It's not forgiving for you. If you make one mistake, you're dead. Then we have Yon. Um, I'm going to talk about Yon and Yasuo here at the same time. I think Yasuo is very easily. All you have to do is not try and kill him. Yasuo players have literally minus 100 IQ. They will perma push. They will perma E through the wave. If you get free pokes onto them, they get too low. You can look to freeze the wave or like slow push and dive. That's also an option. Yasuos are typically really, really bad. They also, a lot of Yasuo players don't know that they can't W your Q. So that surprises them as well. Um, all you have to make sure is after level 6, you have to make sure you don't get ulted and you can use your pool for that. Don't be surprised in the early levels by his level, by his lethal tempo, that's it. But I think Yasuo isn't that hard of a matchup, just don't try and kill him. But you can go Conqueror, that's really good against Yasuo, but don't like fist fight him and take extremely long trades on his side of the lane, play safe, play on your side of the lane, and once he's willing to get onto you on your side of the lane, take a very long trade and you will just win it because you can always go back to your turret. Now Yon is a little bit more difficult. Um, Yon has an insane amount of all-in potential uh, with his E and his third Q. Uh, this champion is a lot more, uh, a lot less forgiving if you play against him. One mistake against Yasuo is fine, one mistake against Yon is you're just dead. So Yon is all about punishing him level 1, level 2, level 3, you already have to be a bit careful. So typically what I like to do in, uh, towards Yon is I like to bully him level 1, I like to bully him level 2, I crash the wave under his third so that I get level 3. Like so that he doesn't get level 3 under his turret, and I'm not on his side of the lane. Then when the lane pushes back towards me, yes, he will get level 3 first, but I'm not on his side of the lane at that point. The wave is pushing back towards me, so I'm just chilling, and then once I get level 3, I try to freeze the wave on my side of the lane, and that typically works. 
But Jon in the side lane can become very difficult. Um, Jon is one of those champions who goes Borg, who has lethal tempo. And those type of champions, he can also go with Sand. Those type of champions almost always have kill pressure at you during the entire game. So you always have to be careful of Jon. You need to make sure that his third Q doesn't hit you because he can also do this third Q into ult combo and then you're just screwed. So if you, you, you need to make sure that you keep your pull for the Jon ult, otherwise you're just screwed. You can't just let him Q you and then like try to pull the third Q. You have to make sure that you have pull for his ultimate or you're dead. Then we have Zed. Um, honestly, Zed, you might think, hey, why isn't Zed an easy matchup? Don't I counter him? Yes, you can pull the Zed, the Zed ult, but I feel like very unforgiving matchup. Zed doesn't need to ult to kill you. I feel like if you make one misplay, like pre-6, it's a pretty fine matchup. It's pretty easy for you. But after 6, he like once he gets a rated Dirk, he becomes so ridiculously in terms of damage that he doesn't need to eat he doesn't even need the ult to kill you. He can just uh, play around with his WEQ combo. And I would say that most Zeds are really bad. So it's very easy to dodge those combos. But if you play against a good Zed, the matchup is a lot more difficult than most people think. So be sure to have that discipline and pull his ultimate. And also try to find creative ways to dodge his WEQ combo. Then we have the Vex matchup. I think Vex is... I don't know. Vex is annoying. Because an early, I feel like she can kind of punish you. Level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. At level 6, you do have a lot of all-in potential and the matchup isn't that hard, but she can easily roam with the range on her ult. If it's a good Vex, she might snowball really, really hard and get a lot of impact on the game with her ult. If it's a bad Vex, who is bad at hitting skill shots, you're just chilling. You outskill the Vex very easily, but it's just that this is champion with a lot of snowball potential. She has some potential to bully you in lane a little bit as well, so um, it becomes dangerous if you're facing a good Vex. Um, so sometimes you just have to keep her in lane. That's like the main thing. You outscale her, so you just want to keep her in lane and prevent her from roaming. Then we have Zix. Zix is one of those matchups where he just sits at his nexus and he still hits you with his bombs. Very annoying. A very good Zix is unkillable. He sits at his third and there's no way for you to get onto him. Honestly, a good Zix would be in the hard tier. He also skills extremely well, so I could even put him into the virgin tier. But honestly, most Zix that I play against have minus 200 IQ. They're really, really bad. And at level six, you just all in them. Um, Pantheon is quite easily because you can W his W. The only thing about Pantheon is he does a ridiculous amount of damage in season 14 with the new items. And I don't know, I feel like if you make one misplay against Pantheon, you can lose your entire HP bar. Or you always have to take, like you always have to be patient of his ultimate as well. He could always ult you. It's very difficult to uh, shove in lane sometimes. So against Pantheon, it's, I would say it's a skill matchup. It's not super hard in a 1v1, but he can easily surprise you. And it's easy, like it's easy to make a mistake against a Pantheon. And then you just, again, it's not a forgiving matchup. That's why I'm going to put it in skill matchup and not in easy. Then we have Ari. Ari is an easy matchup. You just queue, she queues, you just win. It's as simple as that. Um, don't go face first into Ari. You need to go Ari Scorch or Conqueror and the matchup becomes very, very easy. Um, then we have Fizz. Fizz is also pretty easy against Fizz. I like to go Airy Scorch with Nullifying Orb. If you go full lane oriented against Fizz, there's not much he can do in terms of like D-Ring and Airy Scorch, Nullifying Orb, Bone Plating, Revitalize. If you go that setup, he doesn't have a lot of counterplay. You can also pull his ultimate, um, so you should be fine. The only thing is level 1, level 2, level 3. You want to bully him, but make sure at level 3 he doesn't get an amazing all-in angle onto you. But other than that, this matchup is pretty fine. It, the only difficult part about this matchup is that he goes Ignite. And then if you go face rush and he goes ignite, you might struggle. So therefore, typically I always go airy scorch with nullifying orb, second wind revitalize so that when I'm playing versus an ignite fizz, there's not much he can do. Like he literally has no counterplay. Then we have the Katrina matchup. Katrina matchup is quite easy as well. You can just poke her very, very easily. Just make sure that at level three, she doesn't have an option to run you down. So make sure you're not at her side of the lane at level three. So you could do like a level two crash or if you can bully her a lot, a level three crash. Kiana also very, very easily. Um, the only problem with Kiana is once she has serrated Dirk, even though she's behind, she does a ridiculous amount of damage. So you always have to be careful about her all-in potential and obviously just pull her ultimate um, if you need to. And then it's an easy matchup. Against Kiana also make sure, and the same goes for Katarina, that they don't outroam you. So in these matchups, it might be very interesting to put a ward in the middle of the lane. And whenever there's a play on the map that you think they might roam towards, just walk up, try to ult them, try to queue them, try to keep them in lane. Then we have Swain. Swain is easy. Swain can't really do anything towards you unless you get perma grabbed, but that's basically your bad. If you feel like you're struggling, that you perma permanently get grabbed, just buy some early boots and you will be fine. Um, Swain is pretty strong in team fights. People underestimate him though, but you're stronger. So as long as you ignore the Swain in team fights and you go for his backline, you will be fine.
Then we have Talia. Talia is, I don't know, a good Talia might make it somewhat difficult for you to play the lane. But after level 6, I don't see how even a good Talia can stop you from doing anything. After level 6, if you have Ghost Flash, dude, there's nothing she can do about it. You just all in her permanently. So yeah, that's that. Then we have Xeroth. Xeroth also very easy. He's an artillery mate, so it can become annoying if he perma -cues you. But if he perma -cues you, you just shove in the wave and then you roam or you recall and it's fine anyway. Um, though it only becomes difficult this matchup if you stand into your minion wave constantly or if you stand behind your minion wave that's when it becomes difficult because then he can hit you and the wave at the same time and now you're low and he perma gets prio in the lane so you have to stand next to your minion wave then we have vagar vagar is free scaling um i feel like it's just chilling early on you don't want to fist fight this guy too much um the only annoying thing is that yeah he is kind of relevant in team fights it's almost impossible for Vagar to die without just one-tapping somebody. So he will always have some value in teamfights. So that's a bit annoying. But especially at level 6, you can perma-dive him. Uh, you can just pull his cage and there's not really a lot he can do about it. Then we have Yasuo. We already discussed this matchup. So let's move on towards the piss easy tier. Um, there we have Corky. I think Corky can't really do anything against you. Be aware, piss easy doesn't mean like, oh, I'm just gonna walk up at level 1 and fight the Corky. You're going to lose if you do that. Because Corky level 1 is actually really, really strong. So what you want to do is you just let him fight you. Like he needs to be the one that decides his matchup. Because Corky is a lot stronger than most people think in the early game. But if you just chill and you keep the wave on your side of the lane, which you can easily do, you're just chilling. And then at level 6, you just one-tap him. At level 6, there's not a lot he can do. He will try to farm the wave from a distance. But if he overextends once, like he doesn't uh, respect his ultimate range and he walks up too far, you just all in him with Ghost Flash. Then we have Jace. Jace doesn't get picked too much in the mid lane anymore, but you can basically just W his entire combo. When he likes to QW onto you, you just pull. You dodge it and boom. Jace has no damage anymore. It's a free match. That's everything for the matchups. I try to avoid rambling too much, um, but I had to give some quick thoughts about every single matchup. So this is going to be, this is going to last a little bit longer than I thought it would be, but at least now you guys have some information about every single matchup. Alright, so instead of doing something as boring as a matchup tier list, let's get started with something fun like the skin tier list. So obviously, um, if, you, if you're wondering why is Cafe Cuties in like this Cafe Virgin segment, like dude, honestly, if you even consider playing Vladimir with the Cafe Cutie skin, just leave this video. Don't ever touch Vladimir again, it's just not for you. Now, if you look at the D tier, there we have Count Vladimir and the Broken Covenant Vladimir. First of all, I'm not a big fan of Count Vladimir. It's just nothing special. It doesn't feel that good. I'm not a big fan of it. Then the Broken Covenant skin, you might think, why is the latest and greatest Vladimir skin in the D tier? Well, one, I just don't like it. I hate the Q animation and the W is a church floor or something. I really don't like it. It's also pink, so I don't want to play a raid boss that's pink. Like, that could be something that you're into, but yeah, miss me with that shit, honestly. Um, then also, what's really knowing about the skin is that I had great expectations for it. When I heard that there finally was a new Vladimir skin, I was extremely hyped and then they pulled this crap off. So no thank you, but uh, let's go to the C tier. In the C tier, we have the standard, the basic Vladimir skin. Um, honestly, I put it in the C tier because it's not that bad, but honestly, I played it way too much. And second of all, also, they could have done more with it. You're basically completely red and yeah, there could, they could have done more with it. Then to the B tier, these are skins that are actually not that bad. I enjoy playing these skins once in a while, like um, the Academy Vladimir skin and Vandal Vladimir. I think Van Vandal Vladimir is so old, but because it's so old, it feels nostalgic and I actually like playing it every once in a while. I'm not saying it's a great skin, but I do enjoy playing it once uh, in a while. And same goes for Academy Vladimir. I think... The scarf has something, like offers a nice touch. It becomes very boring very quickly, but I don't know, sometimes I just like playing it. There we go to the better skins um, and the A tier. These are, most of these skins are skins that are actually pretty good and feel smooth, but I just personally don't really like them that much to put them in the A S tier. So we have Dark Waters Vladimir. The skin looks pretty well, looks pretty fine. Um, it feels really smooth and also the ultimate is quite good because it's pay to win, uh, especially if you ult in the river, they will literally not see it. But honestly, the character model with the skin, the character design, it becomes very boring very quickly. Like it's in the beginning, I found this to be like an S tier skin, but it became very boring very quickly. And then here we have the Cosmic Devourer Vladimir skin, um, also becomes very boring. This It has some annoying sounds. Like, I think it's when you hit the E or something at max charge or something, or maybe a red Q, but it has annoying sounds. I really don't like it. I think it's the E, actually, if you release it at max charge. And yeah, I hate it, so uh, the skin also becomes quite boring quite fast. Then we have, I think it's called Nightbringer Vladimir, and this skin is actually not that bad, but I don't know, back in the day I loved this skin, and now since I've played Bloodlord and stuff a lot more, it feels like this skin is a little bit cheap. Like, if you look at the cape of Nightbringer in-game, 
it doesn't look that good and it just bothers me quite a bit. Now if you go to the S tier, um, obviously Bloodlord is by far my favorite skin on Vladimir. It feels amazing. You feel like the character model is very, very big and that makes you feel like a rain boss. Also, when you laugh, when you control four on your keyboard and you laugh, it's very amazing to tilt the shit out of your enemies with your laugh. So overall, amazing skin. Then we have Marquise, maybe a surprisable skin. I don't know, like... A lot of people don't think this is a very good skin, but the character model on Vladimir and this skin feels so tiny, so small, that whenever I play the skin, I feel like I can dodge every skill shot in the game. Especially when you play like 20 games of Bloodlord, and then you go back to the Marquis skin, it feels like you can dodge every skill shot in the game. And that feeling, I don't know, it's unmatched by all the other skins. So I love Marquis, especially after I've been playing Bloodlord, then Marquis just becomes an S tier skin. Like Marquise is basically the skin where that you use to basically basically say, I'm going to style on you. Like if you want to show to your lane opponent that you're going to destroy them, Marquise is the skin to do it. It's li literally saying, I'm not going to get hit by one skill shot. I'm going to style on you. That's Marquise. And then we have Nosferatu. Uh, this is the Baldimir skin. Um, I really love the skin. Like there's nothing as satisfying as going the Baldimir skin and going Conqueror and just clapping your opponents. Like honestly, the cape on this skin is amazing. It's the best cape on, of all the skins and also your bald. So what more? do you need but no honestly i think this skin goes very well in team with what vladimir is all about and i just like it it has this very grim look with the very dark black cape it's also a very big cape and for some reason it feels amazing uh, especially when i go conqueror and just destroy team fights it makes me feel like a raid boss as well um so that's why i put it in s tier Honestly, if you're still watching at this point, and I don't know how long this guide is about to be, but I think it's going to be quite long. So if you're still watching at this point, you're an absolute legend, or maybe you're even slightly crazy. But I'm the person who made this guide, and I put even a lot more time in it than the length of this video. So that makes me crazy as well. So let's be crazy together. Now, something that's not crazy is liking and subscribing to this video if you've enjoyed it, and if you're looking out for more content like this in the future. If you have any tips and tricks or any comments, any questions, feel free to ask me in the description down below. And definitely don't forget to check out my coaching in the description down below as well. Thank you so much for watching. You're an absolute legend and I hope to see you in my other videos as well. Bye.